Right. Glad you guys could be here with us today. I'm getting things set up on my screen here. All right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Am I saying marketing speech is made up by Morgoth? Well, I mean, in a sense, actually, you know, in this, like, I like certainly the from a Morgoth. Well, I Sauron maybe. I mean, from a from a from a, a Tolkien oh standpoint, this or or even like Sarumanic, really, the kind of that's it, Saruman, the whole that's, sort of you know, like function over over yeah. form, you know, and like, like let's just try to like go for some kind of like I was gonna say blunt efficiency, but yeah, Hakan and Chris were both uh, suggesting Saruman there too. Um, uh, yeah, you know, uh, I, I don't know. It seems. Um, Kind of sad, uh, and exactly the kind of thing certainly Tolkien would not have approved of. Not just like because of a of a word thing, but he really. I mean, think of how much he hated this, even in architecture. You know, like uh, ugly modern buildings, and how much he kept complaining about those, and you know, and how like you know, modern people who make things, you know, uh, have no like care for the like the beauty of the thing that is made and all that kind of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Uh, but but yes, the whole modern marketing thing. No, I think that's Saruman, definitely. Yeah, Sharky that speak. is true. There you go. So, yeah. speak. Saruman is for sure a marketer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Though ironically, like his big sales pitch was pretty bad. Uh, <laughs> that's true. He's a, yeah. So he's not, a, he's not a marketer. He's a bad marketer. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I, I mean, he he was pretty. I mean, that whole you know, like you said, you know, this his whole power of speech thing works. It's just kind of it, yeah. it, it kind of lost him. Right. No. Exactly. His in well, his, the, in particular, <laughs> this like his his sales pitch to Gandalf is the one I was yeah. especially thinking of. You know, the first one. Um, not oh, the, the first one. Yeah, yeah. Not the one of the steps of Orthanc, but like the first one. As far as like, um, you know, I. I he didn't understand his market. He no, he really audience. didn't. And like no. his 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 odds at like you know closing that particular deal were really low. You know, yeah. with that with yeah. that. Um, uh, his second. But then again, the, maybe the, the he knew that was going to be the case. You know, yeah, maybe. he probably went into it knowing he was going to have to shut him up on the roof. So right, was he just looking for an excuse to yeah, to to, to lock him up? You know, he didn't really want to work with him. I mean, he was just trying to exploit him anyway. So yeah, maybe. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Maybe that makes it more of a salesperson as opposed to a marketing person. <laughs> right. There's a distinction. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, okay. we're not on air. I yeah. Mean, we're sorry, on. no, Hakan, we're still just we chatting. Uh, we're we're we just uh, yeah we're in the second phase of starting. The gang is back <laughs> together, so we're schmoozing. <laughs> yeah, we have this whole build up, right? Uh, first, where we get ourselves online uh, off stage, and then we bring then we, in the people and yeah. still chat for a while, including you guys in our chat. And then now uh, we're finally getting uh, getting things together. Yeah, sorry uh, to the uh, newer folks who are kind of confused. Not used to this. <laughs> getting things together here. It's the pre-show, exactly, uh, exactly, Karita. It's funny, Karita. I had to like do research there because your name is not coming for some reason. It's like the questions box is not. And go to webinars not registering your name. It just says on mine. It says waiting for name, which is kind of fun. Uh, but I, I I deduced that it was you. So uh, and you you don't appear on the attendee list. You were like cloaked. You were invisible, which is kind of fun. Anyway, my cat is absolutely fascinated with my laptop this morning. I'm gonna have to like walk around <laughs> the kitchen with my laptop in my hand so she doesn't jump on the keyboard. <laughs> Uh, yeah. All right, I think we're good. She, I think she went off That's to do it. something else, so we're good. Right, we can start now. I, problem I don't have. <laughs> okay. All right, right we like, ready? No, I, knew be, I knew you'd be like lifting your lip. In, in <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I don't disdain cats. Uh, I, I, I don't. Just, they're cats. just life-threatening to your family. So. Exactly. I've developed yeah. an aversion to them. Like when I see right. them, I naturally cringe back because I'm right. like, no, I mustn't. Because I want to keep my family alive. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. I don't want to have to burn my clothes after I come into contact with that cat. Um, but uh, anyway, cool. <laughs> it doesn't right. just say waiting for name. It says waiting for name offline. How weird. Oh, 
Wow. Yeah. No, Karita is completely cloaked. You're, you're on. Yeah. So you've hacked in on your yep. phone, huh, Karita? Is that is that is that what happened here? Yeah. Okay. That's cool. All right. All right. Cool. I think, uh, Dave, that we're ready to go. We are. I think we're warmed up now on Twitch as well. So we should be good. Ready to talk about Kelleborn and Coadriel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, Maria's tried to box us into a corner here. Uh, you know, we didn't get around to. <laughs> we didn't get around to it last time. She has uh, like she uh, made this us gonna a, work. Yeah, she's made us a spreadsheet which only includes Kaladriel <laughs> and Kelborn. Like, there's nothing else to talk about today, folks. This is what we're doing. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, okay. Uh, so, Dave, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Cool. All right. It <laughs> sounds uh, like, well, of course. I've been ready for an hour. Obviously, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Starting. It's in. almost 7.30 in California. Why wouldn't he be ready? Starting in three, two, one. Pausing for the convenience of the editor. Hello. Good morning, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Silmarillion Film Project. We're bringing you two in two weeks, which is always exciting um, and probably good since we're about to go on a long, lengthy holiday break. I am your co-host, Dave Kale, broadcasting to you live from Southern California. Alas, not from Netflix headquarters this morning. I'm at home, but okay. still very, very <laughs> exciting as always. And the highlight this morning, uh, two, twofold, two, two exciting highlights. The first being that... Um, uh, Trish has returned to us. Thank oh, goodness. Oh, you are so good. He's so to fill good. The, to, fill the, to fill the awkward pauses. And uh, <laughs> what, am I, what am I talking about? With Corey, there are no awkward pauses. Um, <laughs> that's right. And that, <laughs> I, I, I'd have to stop for breath for that to happen. That's true. <laughs> yes. uh, so, yeah. So, the Tolkien maven, Trish Lambert, is with us. And, of course, with us, as always, is the illustrious Tolkien professor, Corey Olson. Uh, and then the second exciting thing is that um, uh, through the assistance of the folks who prepare us, we're we're hoping to be very disciplined and to talk a lot about um, Celeborn and Gladriel. Well, and, now see, here um, is the thing. Okay, yes. so Marie might be no. like a little bit edgy about the fact that you guys <laughs> didn't make too much headway last week. But see, to me, it's a huge benefit because since I wasn't here last week, and we get to talk about Celeborn and Galadriel. That's so right. You didn't miss it. Yeah. I didn't miss yeah. it. That's right. Now, really, I was just I, stalling to make sure to include you in the conversation, That's it. Trish. That's yeah. it. That's, that it, was, that was That's what they were doing. They're so <laughs> they're so clever. The other thing I got to say about the lengthy hiatus, I got to say what I'm going to miss. I'm going to miss doing a show with Dave in the lobby of a hotel. <laughs> With people moving furniture in the background. I think that was a Riddles in the Dark episode, wasn't it? And we were doing it like between Christmas and New Year's, I think. And Dave was like on a family vacate, you know, break somewhere in a hotel. It was hilarious. Yeah. And he was in like the echoey stairwell of the hotel, is that right? Yeah, call? and you could yes. hear people moving furniture and stuff. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah that I mean, I'm not one to talk. I got the noisy parrot, right, that might be in the background because he's ticked off. I've left him in the cave, so he may make his voice heard. But um, anyway. But anyway, it's good to be back. I'm thrilled we're talking about Celeborn and Galadriel today. Yeah. You, can pause, you can count on me to interrupt, even when there aren't uh, uncomfortable pauses. I will just <laughs> blurt. That's good. That's good. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. No, I'm really excited. Last week was uh, last week was a lot of fun. That was a, a, a one of those uh, very unanticipated kind of discussions, but which I'm really glad that we had, especially in the context of this season. There's so much. Um, so many political interactions, you know, so much of the drama of this season is involved in, you know, this sort of complex interpersonal and political web that we're building here in Beleriand during, you know, our exciting part one of a Beleriand and its realm season. Um, but we, in order to do that, you know, for us to, to, to take some time and go through and think through some of these issues about what, you know, uh, the, the Elvish culture is like and what it means to be a king and, and what the role of the high king is and all that, all that kind of thing. Um, there's, um, uh, there's, that was really important work to have done. And I feel, I, I, I feel better for having talked about it. So uh, I think that that'll be really helpful as we move forward. Now, speaking of keeping us honest, Hakon is apparently bringing a, a couple of other uh, questions here. Oh, yeah. No, we'll, we'll get to those, Hakon, definitely. Okay. They're, they're, they're on the list. We're going to do Celeborn and Galadriel first, and then after that, we, we, we're going we're gonna to move on down. We're definitely not going to forget the bad guy storyline. Uh, the men in Hildorian we're going to not do. 
um, because we're saving that. We're saying, well, I don't think we're going to do Hildorian at all. Um, I think we're going to, uh, yeah, we're going to wait until the men come into Beleriand, and then we're just going to hint vaguely. Uh, um, <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, we'll definitely do the bad guys. We'll definitely solve the Ordreth question. I'm not trying to delay that forever. Um, but uh, but I think we can go another yet another session without resolving it. So that'll be fun. Um, so let's do that. Um, yeah, cool. All right. So. Um, uh, oh, wait, first, announcements. I almost forgot. Let's do announcements. One announcement. Tex Moot is coming up soon. We have our next regional moot is now approaching. We're almost a month away from Tex Moot. And as usual, Tex Moot is uh, uh, like everything's bigger in Texas, right? And and it, it's, it is looking again that like Tex Moot is going to be the most uh, uh, heavily attended regional moot of the year for the second year in a row. Um, uh, there is uh, always we're still a month away, and there's already a large number of people registered for text. And I'm delivering a paper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that could actually make more people come, or have people. Come. I don't know which. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. It's uh, um, um, it's going to be fun. I'm, I'm so excited that you can come and, and uh, uh, do a paper this uh, this year, Trish, and we're going to do, I'm going to be on a panel, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So we're going to have <clears throat> two-thirds of our team there uh, right. this year. And between, it's like with uh, L.A. Moot, right? We had exactly. Between this and L.A. Moot, you know, I will have, uh, uh, you know, we'll have connected with both of you this year, which is, uh, which is, which is fun. So anyway. Uh, uh, so definitely January 17th in Waco, Texas. Uh, you can find the registration information if you go to signumuniversity.org uh, and scroll down just a little bit to our events section there on the front page. You can find uh, a link to TexMoot or just go to TexMoot.org uh, is the main uh, site for TexMoot and you can find the registration information there. So there you go. Um, so don't forget about TexMoot because it's going to be awesome. Now. Thinking back again, goals for the session. Um, we want to focus on the romance between Galadriel and Kelborn, how it develops, how it serves as a microcosm for the Noldor Sindar relations. And I, I, this to me, this is one of the really great things about this um, uh, this whole segment, is that we the danger it seems to me, the greatest danger that I can see in trying to do the whole Noldor Sindar plot line thing is that it's it's too broad it's too general right if we're just doing like high politics all the time um it's gonna kind of i think lose some of the personal touch i'm really glad to have some characters to kind of zoom in closer to and in galadriel what i would really like to uh what i would really like to focus on uh in galadriel's character is essentially to have her be standing in for the Noldor as a whole in their personally coming to grips with the kin slaying and with what they're doing, right? Um, their own guiltiness, right? About, you know, their the, the, the reflections back on what they did, their feelings of, of guilt and remorse for what happened. How do you move forward from that? How do you continue with what you're doing, knowing that like it was built on that foundation, right? So it, it's not just like, oh, I did a thing you know, that I regret in the past. It's not just that. It's like you're still continuing the thing that you began that way, right? So it, it, it's, it, I, it, I think it creates a much broader um, problem for them in thinking through like, what do they do now? You know, how do they go on? How do they continue uh, in, in this world um, that, you know, began so horribly? Um, and yeah, Ellen, I absolutely agree. And the 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 trauma from it too, not just the trauma from the kinslaying, but then of course you also have the trauma uh, of the crossing of the Hell Caraxa, obviously. And uh, and that of course is also complicated, right? Complicated emotionally, complicated um, uh, in the sense that on the one hand, you know, there might be a sense of like but we've, you know, we have, uh, we did wrong, but we paid, you know, uh, we have suffered, uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, but of course 
there's a whole there's a, a a bunch of different ways in which the crossing of the hell caraxa could i think factor in um and for somebody like galadriel personally um with galadriel personally there is the it is extremely personal because we're also talking about her mom uh in and and of course her mom you know arwen is a great sort of embodiment of this is why i think goadriel is such a great choice for sort of personalizing this whole thing and showing how this impacts uh the noldor individually you know in, how it impacts them personally and not just politically um because you know the death of her mom is like a symbol of you know the slaying of the teleri right i mean she is a she is a really good kind of embodiment of um uh of the Teleri who were lost, you know, the kin who were slain. Um, uh, remember, you know, Thingol saying, I marvel at you, son of Arwen, right? You know, uh, to, to Finrod when he finally confronts him with the kin slaying, uh, when Thingol finally confronts Finrod with the kin slaying. Um, it's the fact that they are so personally connected, right? To, you know, she is their personal connection uh, to the Teleri. Um, so her death, and of course, we killed her off uh, in the kinsling, which is not explicitly done, of course, in the text. Um, it's um, uh, it's that it just, I, as I say, I, I think that it works really well as a, a sort of a personalizing of the whole kinsling issue. Uh, so anyway, so I really I like that. Jumping ahead here, but yeah. you know, you, you saying that out loud got mm -hmm. me thinking. I would imagine that when Celeborn first meets Galadriel, he's like the opposite of thrilled. Right. Right? Right. Like he's got to get over his horror at what she was involved in, right? I had never mm -hmm. really thought about that before. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I don't think that we should have Celeborn being just like, you know, infatuated at first glance with Galadriel, right. right? I mean, on the one hand, she's very beautiful, right? And will certainly have an imposing presence, but I don't think she would be sort of, I don't know, wielding that presence very much. Um, so some of you who are involved in the script thing, remind me, where did we, I'm trying to remember, but I, I, I'm, I'm forgetting this level of detail. Where did we last leave Galadriel? We didn't, did we did we have her very much in the crossing of the hell caraxa did we have her on screen for that very often did we we had her interacting with fingolfin as i recall right uh she was uh, and i'm trying to remember the the kind of the she was arguing with fingolfin oh and that's what i vaguely remembered um uh yeah um she was challenging his leadership right right exactly okay all right, so we have to be consistent with that, which doesn't fit what I was just going to be saying. Well, maybe we can. Have, okay, so, <clears throat> so these are the, the the first questions that we have to answer, therefore, in thinking about Galadriel and Celeborn's relationship. Um, and by the way, uh, Hakon was just raising the fact that one of the one of the risks here of choosing Galadriel and Celeborn as our sort of focal point is that there's a risk of losing Fingolfin a bit. And I totally agree. We don't want Fingolfin to sink absolutely into the background here. Um, so we do need to think about that. And Hakan, I'm tempted to think about that right now, but I don't want to get, I, I have an idea. Let's talk about Galadriel and Kelvin first. Look how afraid of Marie, I am, Marie I'm, is. I am, I am afraid. I'm, I'm afraid. I, don't want to, I can't possibly face Marie if we just talk about Fingolfin the whole time. So, but Hakan, remind me. Put a right? pin in that. Yes. <laughs> Remind me when we when we when we wrap up Galadriel and Celeborn, which doubtless we'll do well before the session is done. Remind me about the Fingolfin question, and let's definitely let's definitely return to that now. Um, okay. So, uh, right. Okay. So, Ellen, you're right. We had sort of conflict, and then we had Galadriel acknowledging Fingolfin's leadership. Right. So, no, I, I it's I wasn't thinking necessarily that we want to start her as a rival, but. Anyway, okay, so as I was saying, the first thing we need to begin with is where do they where do they start, right? Where is Galadriel at the beginning of this season? Um, you know, how do we how do we depict her to start? And what's Celeborn's 
initial attitude like what's their initial attitude towards it so where each of them at the beginning um just on their own and then how do they respond to each other at the very beginning you know hakan raises a good point um and i i just have to say that consensus on the forums doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily like a decider for me but i respect that there's consensus on the forums i just right. want to say that. side note um but he makes the point of that they recognize each other. And I was just thinking about that when he said, you know, they recognize that their souls are meant to be together. I mean, that is kind of a Tolkien thing, you know, Baron and Lucian, Arwen and sure. Aragorn. I mean, there is this one in some enchanted evening kind of <laughs> thing, right? Right. right. He, he has in all of his great love stories. So I, you know, if we want to be true to the professor, there would be some kind of soul recognition thing gone. Right. But, but it doesn't mean it has to work like like not no, everybody no. is like. But yeah, no, I, I would think I it would agree. be more like, especially at once Caliborn understands Kinslaying and Cal and Galadriel's participation, it would be more like he's fighting his inclination, right? He wants to fight against his soul recognition, sort of. Right, or or I, I think maybe I would even. I, I, say basically the same thing but actually kind of in the opposite direction to say that it is only this like oh god i got attraction it. that he feels that for her him, that right. makes him resist the temptation just to reject her completely to reject her yeah yeah, yeah yeah that works too yeah 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 in um, fact that's probably more the other what i said is more of a tropey thing you know um, right right I and i don't you know i i i i i like to resist the temptation to resist tropes at all points you know like it's that seems to me a thing in uh a lot not just in hollywood but in modern thinking like if it's an established thing that means you should never do it by definition which is silly um things are established things for a good reason I love the way think. that's true that's true and yeah, yeah it's like they're stereotypes for a reason right yeah well um, exactly. i mean I often kind of yeah is extremely i love this economy of thinking here it saves us from creating reasons for their love and attraction <laughs> right and yeah we, we certainly don't want to you know have to like itemize it right you know uh, nor do we need to create go out of our way to create like strange circumstances or whatever um but yeah so if but I, I, I want to get back to the sort of the complicated point of Galadriel's state. Because here's the thing. I want, based on the story that I, we were, you know, the, the, the fundamental concept that I was articulating a couple uh, sessions ago, I want Galadriel to be in a sort of depressive state. And we have to get her there. And uh, if she was still being, so if she was still in like leadership conflict with Fingolfin, I think we need to show her sort of withdrawing into herself. Because, of course, one thing that's really noteworthy, right? Galadriel, we were, we've done a lot. Uh, we have been influenced pretty heavily in our depiction of Galadriel by the one line which, you know, Christopher uh, put back into the published Silmarillion of, uh, you know, like the, one of the thing, one of the Galadriel references that he, that he, you know, that sort of, kept in the published Silmarillion about how she was, you know, one of those who really wanted to rule a realm at her own will. Right. Um, you know, her, her, her desire for, re for realm ruling uh, is a significant factor with her. However, notice she doesn't rule a realm when she gets to Beleriand. Right. Um, and I think that that, that seems to me something that needs explanation. Right. Um, uh, I, I, I think that that's something that we need to, uh, um, we need to, to figure out. And to me, I think that going in the direction that we were thinking of, that is having her really kind of withdraw and go to, go to, um, you know, she ends up going to, to Doriath, right. To, uh, be with Thingol and Melian as a kind of, I don't want to say a retreat because it's not like she's retreating away from people. I mean, she's, she's, you know, going to Doriath where there are plenty of folks. Uh, so it's not like she's fleeing society. Um, but for her to kind of seek wisdom and clarity and uh, she feels really bad. Like um, anyway, so 
Uh, yeah. See, Marie, exactly. I do think that the audience would expect her to be eager to set her own realm, just like all the other Noldor. I think we need to explain that, right? Um, and we need to show her turning away from that, but not turning away from it in a um, refusing the ring and the fellowship of the ring kind of moment, right? This is not her moment of final humility where she, you know, sets those aspirations aside and, you know, agrees that she will, uh, you know, that she will fade and pass into the West. Um, now, Ellen, I agree. She isn't talking about her problems with Melian. She wants, to, I think that she wants to learn from Melian, but she doesn't, she doesn't like take Melian as her confessor. Right. Um, so it seems to me that the so the problems we have is first the first thing that we need to do is establish Galadriel essentially like retiring from public life or stepping away from public life. She, the uh, I, you guys were confirming that my vague memory of what we did with her at the end of season three is correct. We had her be active in leadership and sort of challenging Fingolfin's leadership. Um, and as Nick was pointing out, Fingolfin was vindicated. That doesn't necessarily mean that uh, Galadriel has to love it, right? And uh, totally concede. But anyway, Fingolfin was vindicated uh, in his leadership. Um, so, but the fact that she was actively um, she was actively, actively sort of involved in that kind of role, that she was uh, at least sort of involved in like the leadership question um, with the Noldor who were crossing the Helcaraxa um, is, uh, suggests that she's not just been like withdrawn and depressed the whole time since the Kinslaying, right? Uh, so this is suggesting to me that what we want to, um, uh, what we want to imagine is a, I don't know, a moment of crisis for her. Like there has to be a decision point, a moment where she says, you know what? Realms are being established, right? People are establishing their realms. She doesn't establish a realm. Um, she instead does something else. And what do we want to have her do? And why do we want her, her uh, to have her do it? Um, and Ellen, yeah, I know she doesn't go to Doriath right away. Um, it says like a cheerleader. What do we want her to do? Why do we want her to do? <laughs> Why do we want her to do it? No, exactly. I mean, that's so. Why does she, Why does she not take a realm? Is it because she feels unworthy? Like when it comes to it, she. I mean, this is something like a moment of. Um, uh, this is something like a, a, a moment of uh, of doubt, a moment of clarity. Um, Are we at a point in her relationship with Melian where Melian would have any influence on this? Well, the problem is we've got to get her to Melian. Oh, uh, right? yeah, that's I mean, what I was thinking. Yeah, she's not She could visit there and yet, maybe right? decide to stay. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe, maybe actually she realizes she has a lot to learn or something. Yeah. Ooh. Maybe we can. Maybe we can use this to establish like the kind of effect that Melian has on folks, right? Hmm. Um, if she like, what? Okay. What if she? So she would. They, they get to Beleriand, and she is. Um, she is still like basically planning to have a public career, right? So the first step, she's the one who takes it upon herself to go and be like the initial, the first ambassador to Thingol, right? Um, uh, you know, there's like, people know there's going to be awkwardness, right? So it's Goadriel who steps forward to say, um, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I, I, I'm going to sort it, right? I'm going to go and talk to Thingol and, uh, and uh, you know, introduce myself because I'm his kin anyway, and um, I can handle this situation, right? And then she gets there and she meets Melian and the meeting with Melian is the thing which kind of, you know, opens these, you know, doors in her own mind. Like she is sort of forced to confront in her initial conversation with Melian, she's sort of in, uh, forced to confront these things. About, and that kind of is what leads her to her crisis and her, and then she ends up staying, right? She ends up staying not mm -hmm. just as an ambassador, but as a uh, um, protege. You know, protege. And, and so, you know, so she, she would be conflicted towards Melian. She doesn't want to say all the truth to Melian. She withholds the truth from Thingol and from Melian, both. Um, 
And so she doesn't want to admit it, but she does, you know, sort of want to learn from Melian and, um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, uh, Marie and Ellen, I know that Angrod is the one who does that. Um, I, but I, I don't, do we need him here? I mean, we can need him later, but that's fine. Um, we see later on that the sons of, you know, the children of Finarfin are in and out of there, right? Uh, on the regular, you know, Finrod and Angrod and, and, and all them, and presumably Ignor, though we don't see very much of him ever. Um, uh, so I don't know that we need him. Do we need him? Do we need two ambassadors? Do we need two people? That, we're going to have two sons of, you know, two children of Finarfin there in Doriath. Uh, do we need that many? Um, we want Angrod, I know, to be the one to spill the beans like he did in the text, but he doesn't have to be the officially appointed, appointed ambassador for that. Um, he can still play the role of bearing the message back because Galadriel is going to, she's not going to do it anymore, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, well, let's see, and Ellen, we don't have to be bound by what the text says. Um, I don't ever want to just reject what the text says for no reason, but if we have, if we have, you know, we are, we are creating a totally different dramatic product, a totally different narrative product, uh, than Tolkien was producing. Um, and so we absolutely can change things if it's, remember the, the general rule is right. We can change things if it's awesome enough. And I'm not saying that any of the major points need to be changed. Like the Angrod and Karanthir con confrontation. There's no reason to, there's no reason. I don't see any reason to change that. It's fine. But what I'm wanting to establish is Galadriel's role. What I like about it is now notice what Tolkien does not do in his story is explain why the heck Galadriel's there at all right? She just pops up in Doriath and she's there. For some reason, we don't know why. Doing what? We have no idea what, right? And that's exactly what we are doing in this season is giving Galadriel's story, right? In a way in which Tolkien flat doesn't give Galadriel's story in Doriath. Why does she go? Why is she there? Why does she stay? What does she do, right? How does she meet Caliborn? We don't know any of these things. We have almost no data on any one of those things. Um, and we're telling that story. So, um, here's what we're, so this is what I'm thinking. What I'm thinking is, uh, sh it works if we make that the turning point. We're not actually changing anything. She takes it upon herself to, uh, be, and it, like being the ambassador again, <clears throat> not convinced that's how elves even work, right? Do we need an appointed ambassador? Like, is this going to be someone's official job? Do they get a salary, right? Do they get dental benefits along with being the ambassador to the court at Doriath? Like, it's not how it works. All we have is somebody being a messenger, like somebody who is trusted by both sides, who can communicate between the two of them. Galadriel takes that. Is that even appointed, right? Is somebody delegated to do that? Carinthia, of course, points out that nobody did, right? That was one of his beefs, or at least one of the things that he says with Angrod, right? Um, so... Even within the text, we get the whole dynamic of, um, you know, like the children, uh, you know, a child of uh, uh, of, uh, of Finarfin taking it upon himself to do that. Let's have Galadriel take it upon herself first, right? That fits her character profile that has been established to this point. Um, she is... Um, uh, she is established as this person who she is, she is ambitious, right? And so it fits within her ambition to go with that intention, but she doesn't follow through with that intention once she gets there, right? Because she's having her moment of crisis. What do you think of that, Trish? First of all, I got to make sure that I'm actually not muted. <laughs> um, no, I think that's good. I think that's a really good idea. And you're so right. I mean, it's, I mean, I always reflect about how, you know, Tolkien just took such shortcuts sometimes. And then well, they I were mean, there. There they were. Just, they were just it's there. Plot summary, right? I mean, like the, the summary, it's, it's like his pl plot summary genre, right? It starts yeah, off as a true. plot summary that he writes for a friend and then he owns it, right? And, uh, yeah. and decides to make that a thing. And it's cool. It's, it's, and it works really and, well. And the but... emphasis is on, is on really epic stuff, right? And, so yeah. you don't spend your time 
like getting it's, people from point A to point B necessarily. It's very Plus sketchy. Traffic. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I think that's a really good uh, direction to take. Yeah. Uh, Marie, great question. Um, uh, how do we want to send her off? Do we have her, do we want to have an initial conversation? Should it be between her and Fingolfin? Should it be between her and, uh, you know, Finrod and, you know, like basically or like a family meeting with her siblings um, where she says, I'm going to go to Doriath and, and I'll see what I can do, right, to help sort this out, help to smooth things with uh, Thingol. He's, you know, uh, he's our, uh, you know, what, great uncle after all, right? So, uh, or something, you know, he's, 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 we're closely related to him. Um, yeah, so, um, I kind of would want that to be Fingolfin, in part for Hakan's reason that um, uh, I don't want to lose Fingolfin. Uh, and again, it seems to me to be a fitting sort of follow-up to what we did at the end of season three. Um, one of the things that we can, one of the questions that I think that we can leave, if she talks to Fingolfin and says to Fingolfin, I'm going to go to Doriath. I'm going to meet Thingol and I'm going to see if I can smooth things out, right? One of the things that we can raise is the question of, is this a, just another bid for power on her part, right? Is this Goadriel's move to sort of win the Sindar over to her side? Are we are we seeing like, a, you know, is, is she going to be trying to vie with Fingolfin, you know, as things go forward? Is this... Is that where this is? That, there should be a question, I think. Is is that where this is going? It's not where this is going, right? Um, I mean, it's certainly going to end up in a very different direction. But I, um, I, I like that as following up um, uh, what we're, what we're, what we're looking at there. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So if she meets with Vingolfin and says, "I'm," gonna, then she goes there. Um, yeah. No, Alan, don't worry. We're not eliminating Angron. I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm going to take a line away from Angron. That's not at all the point. Because remember, who appointed him? He doesn't ever get appointed, right? We're not doing that. She goes there, she has her crisis, and she's out. She doesn't report back to the Noldor. They don't see her anymore. Her brothers have to go and find her. That's probably what brings Angrod there in the first place, right? As he's like, hey, uh, sis, checking in on you. Uh, haven't heard back from you in like a decade that you've been here in Doriath. So uh, what's going on? Um, by the way, one thing generally to keep in mind in season four. I don't see any reason why we need to be, we're not going to be rigorous with chronology in the sense that like, I don't see at any, at any point that we need to like have flashy numbers at the bottom of the screen to say how many years have passed or anything like that. Um, we don't have the same pressure to have time passing. On the one hand, we don't have the same pressure to have time passing that we had like in season two, right? Where we needed, you know, long periods of time to pass and have the, the younger generation grow up, right? Um, you know, we needed to have adult children of Finway by the time we got, or uh, adult grandchildren of Finway, yeah, by the time we got to the end of season two. Um, so, you know, we need to show a great deal of time was passing. We don't need to do that uh, in season four. Um, we do have a fairly longish period of time, but I don't think it matters how much time. And I don't think we need to, I mean, basically the only thing that we need to establish as far as the passing of time is concerned um, is that we need to, um, uh, we need to put, um, we need to show things being built, like cities being built and realms being established. So we're going to be giving the sense that this is not all happening in a week. Right by showing the development of of the different cities and the building of Gondolin, the building of Gondolin will be a, a pretty good time passes uh, technique that we will have available to us. Right as Gondolin is being constructed in the second half of the season, um, so we can be checking in on that and be like, hey, look, time has passed. But I, I'm not. I don't honestly really care to keep meticulous track of like what happens in what year because I don't think it matters so very much. Um, uh, okay, so. I, uh, so where was I? So she goes to, so she's there. And then again, so 
you know, now we bring Angrod there and uh, Angrod is checking up on her and talking to Thingol. And this, and this is how Angrod ends up being the one who goes from Thingol and, and is sort of, you know, speaking for him to uh, the Noldor. And I think Fingolfin can be surprised. You know, it can be a way that we can emphasize what's going on with Galadriel is that Fingolfin is surprised not to hear back from Galadriel, that she is not taking, he expects her to take an active role. He may even have kind of dreaded her taking an, a, a slightly overactive role uh, in, you know, speaking for the Noldor to the Sindar. And he finds that she doesn't and is interested to find that she doesn't. Um, but, uh, anyway, okay. So no, so, sorry. Ellen, the point I'm trying to make is I'm, I'm not talking, I'm not talking about year one. I'm just saying she goes there at the beginning. Do we have a reason not for her not to go? Do, is there, is there something else we want to accomplish with her character? If there's not, um, if we want to begin to, to, to me, where her story begins, where her season four story begins is with her moment of crisis where she ceases to be the ambitious Noldord leader who wants to establish a realm for herself. She has to decide for some reason not to establish a realm. And that has to happen pretty near the beginning on account of she doesn't establish a realm while other people are, right? So why not? Why doesn't she? And this is my answer to that question. Um, and I think it works. I don't see any reason to mess around with her elsewhere first. Uh, again, I, I don't see a compelling story behind that as part of the story that we're giving to uh to to galadriel here um so yeah um yeah um marie yeah so marie says fingolfin is going to be like the anti-melian not galadriel's mentor but her rather ambivalent high king slash uncle yeah, she, he's kind of, so I mean, there will be in that sense, Marie, and I think that we can make this work pretty well on a on on an interpersonal level. Um, I think that we can, uh, she has two kind of authority figures, right? You know, there's Fingolfin on the one side and there's Million on the other side. Uh, and the two of them are, they do differ from each other and they have different perspectives and she has different relationships towards them. Um, but uh, I, I think that we can actually develop some kind of interesting things uh, there, there. Okay, um, so yeah. Remember that we, the Merith Adarthad doesn't happen until like, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, we have plenty of time for Angrod to be able to come and check in with her. Um, we'll figure out which episodes we want to do all these things in um, uh, down the road, um, you know, as we plan out the actual episodes. But we got plenty of time uh, for Angrod to come, to come, you know, check on her. And then he, you know, again, he becomes that go-between like he is in the text. Uh, so that's fine. Um, and now she's moving forward. Now, Kelleborn. Let's talk about Kelleborn's character. Where's he? I don't mean geographically. I mean, like, emotionally, outlook, character. Um, what's he like? He's been when one of the- When was the last time we saw him? When he was on the boat with Kyrdan. He was so- he, Kyrdan, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, he was with Kyrdan when they discovered the burned ships. Right. And when they were going to make contact with the Noldor initially. So we were going to have Celeborn be one of the first of the Sindar to make contact with the Noldor. Um, right. And then he would presumably be with Círdan coming back to Doriath and bringing the news, hey, uh, the Noldor are here and they totally destroyed the armies of Morgoth and were delivered and the Valar probably sent them, we think, right? Probably they sent they, they, they sent them. Um, so uh, anyway, that's the, um, um, that's the, the, uh, the plan there. Okay, so right, okay. he's back in Doriath. So he's there when she arrives. But what's his attitude? What's what's his feeling about the Noldor? Is he? Uh, I mean, does he have any negative feelings towards the Noldor? Is he like open and friendly towards the Noldor? Is he uh, is he suspicious of? I mean, I don't mean suspicious of them. Like, hey, did you kill your kin or something? Like we said last time, that's like literally inconceivable. So, uh, uh, to everybody initially, um, so, but 
I mean, do, does he dis, does he have any distrust for them? Anything kind of, I don't know, sort of negative at all? What do we do with him? Where do we have him be? What's his attitude? Is he just kind of neutral? Generally positive, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, I know we, yeah, I know we had him meeting them in Mithrim, and he and Goadriel can see each other for the first time there. But I don't think we want to have the real beginning of their relationship there. But what we can maybe see, we do want to show this kind of initial meeting, right? Kyrdan and, and Celeborn arrive and meet the Noldor at the beginning of the season. And when they do, Galadriel is still going to be in her like leadership ambitious mode, right? That we saw her in at the end of season three. So his first impression of her is going to be like, here is a, you know, a Noldo woman who is kicking butt and taking names, right? This is someone who is... Uh, making her presence felt among the Noldor. So, I mean, he will be, he will see that in her. And what I am, uh, what I am thinking, what I, what I'm wanting to set up is him seeing the contrast in her. Um, Marie was suggesting maybe uh, Galadriel could go, you know, with Kyrdan's messenger to reach Doriath. Yeah. I don't want, I don't know that I want her, I certainly wouldn't want her traveling with Celeborn. Um, I think the second meeting should be the, I, what I'm envisioning is he meets her for the first time and it doesn't even have to be like a personal meeting. Like he just sees her like that. They, they're both in the same room. Right. And he observes her from a distance. Maybe she doesn't even notice him. Right. I mean, she probably, I mean, she saw him. Right. So she'll recognize him when she sees him again in Doria. Um, but there's no reason that she would have been paying particular attention to him, but he would have been paying particular attention to her. Not only because she's really cute, though she is, but also because um, she's, again, she's like clear, he, he can tell, like she is, uh, uh, she is a forceful personality, she is uh, somebody that uh, that others of the Noldor really respect and listen to, so he can tell that she is a person of consequence among the Noldor when they have, when he has the, his first meeting, he and Kyrdan have their first meeting with the Noldor. When he then meets her again in Doriath, I want it to be a shock to him, right? She is changed because she has met uh, Melian and she's had her moment of crisis and she's sort of, you know, all of her like ambitions kind of come crashing down as she realizes like she still hasn't really coped with the fact that like her kin's blood is uh, again, if not on her actual hands as we just, as we talked about uh, back in last season, but at least, you know, on her, you know, on her clothes and her face. Right. Um, She's at least splattered with the blood of her kin, if, if not actually uh, 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 soiled with it personally. Um, so, yeah, exactly, Marie. She sees, he sees her force of nature, larger than life persona, and then he sees her in doubt. He sees her withdrawn. He sees her totally changed. Uh, or not, not totally changed, but he sees her changed. Um, Who's going to do the wooing? I don't know that wooing is exactly what happens. I think but that they, they, become be best, a... they become best friends and then realize they love each other. It's like a rom-com. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly like that. Like when Harry met Sally. Not We're... exactly best friends. Uh, and nor I realize. Oh, I, I suppose more of an Ao and Faramir kind of thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Dave, what were you saying? I, I was going to say where, where Gladry realizes that Celeborn was the one she wanted all along. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's great. We should have her have a crush on somebody else and then only realize <laughs> at the end of the season that, you know, bland, boring Celeborn is really the one she wants to spend the next few millennia with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Celeborn should be mired in friend zone for like, for like 100 years. <laughs> Yeah, 500 years. To where yeah. we have the audiences wondering, will they ever get together or not? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <Boy. sighs> 
Yeah. Uh, but I do mean it kind of like an Eowyn Faramir thing, you know, in the sense of I not besties, but in other words, he was a, you know, amazing support to her. You know, he's in a time yeah. of crisis for her. And yeah. she didn't really look upon him as like a romantic partner initially, but someone she could really, you know, like talk to and, you know, put her head on his shoulder and all, you know, that kind of, I mean, I, that, yeah. that sort of thing is what I'm talking about, you know, where he, you know, maybe he knows, and yes, you're, you're right. It's not exactly a wooing, but he's kind of like a support to her in a time when she's questioning yeah. herself. And exactly. No, I, exactly. So it's, 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 it is much more like the parallel with a, with a, with a, with a, a farmer in that right. way, except more protracted. Right. And right. Um, <laughs> so again, li- like that, you mean thousands of right. years. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and like with a, the reason that I, that I also do really like the Eowyn and Faramir model is um, it is Faramir who helps Eowyn to kind of mm-hmm. come to a breakthrough, right? Where she sort of, uh, you know, realizes something about herself and figures things out. Um, and that's a, that, that kind of more mentor like role is the thing. Uh, I mean, I, I Which- want hopefully Her, cement some respect on her part so that we see them exactly. you know later with the fellowship we think it's all this you know that he's like you know a gormless idiot but he's not at all and she knows he's not. <laughs> no exactly um exactly yeah now let's i see. do have one question and i think we've talked about this before in a different context but i do wonder you know this thing of like you know many 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 years that are, you know, are going to be passing. I mean, how long does an elf have self-doubt? Oh, Is it indefinitely. <laughs> <laughs> indefinitely. They're not in a rush. Yeah. Yeah. They're not in a rush. <laughs> well, no, I mean, they're not in a rush and, because it's, it, it's, to me, it's one of the things, and we talked about this a little bit last time, but we talked about it more before. I, I, I think that one of the things that, differentiates el- like elvish perspective from human perspective is that the mere passing of time doesn't seem to impact them in the same way it's not just a question of elves operating in the same way that humans mm-hmm. do it's just they have more time to do it in right mm-hmm. uh, i don't think that an elf an elf's way of looking at the world is not the same necessarily as a human who lived for a thousand years mm-hmm. you know? mm-hmm. there would be similarities mm-hmm. definitely mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I think that, um, there's, there's, and one of the things that we get again is that, like the years passing by, remember that experience that the fellowship, like, you know, that, that they, they sort of describe the experience they have in Lothlorien, right. That, that I, that of like stepping outside of time and, mm-hmm. you know, n- one day or, you know, a hundred years could have passed and it would feel the same, right. They can't keep track of time. Um, that seems to me to be like Tolkien seemed to be providing a glimpse of like what it means to be an elf. Right. So it's not just that like the years go by and, you know, you are growing in wisdom and, and you're thinking about your experience, reflecting on your experiences. And we've talked about this in the context of things like reconciliation with guilt, with grief and things like that. Right. Um, you know, humans are just going to respond to that differently, not only in the sense that, you know, they feel more pressure to move on from stuff because if they don't, they're going to lose the whole lifetime that they have, you know, and they don't have much time. It's, it's, it's not just about that. I think that like an elf and a human 10 years removed from a traumatic situation would be in very different places. Like I think for the elf, it would still be very much more fresh. You know, it's, they're not going to feel as distanced from it as a human would feel after 10 years. I mean, even if the human is still grieving after 10 years, it's not going to be the same kind of grief. Like they will have changed there. Um, it will have, it will have developed in some ways and elves seem to me in this way, more kind of static, you know, uh, static is the wrong word, but, um, uh, again, the relationship with time just seems kind of, uh, uh, kind of, kind of different. Um, yeah. Okay. But I think so, then I think about thought processes, though. You know, is, is that their thought processes are slower? I mean, it's I don't know. Well, it's I don't want to get Maria will get mad at me, so I don't want to get. <laughs> stay, on, stay on target. No, <laughs> it's it's all good. Um. So. Okay. Uh. Hey, I have an, I have an idea. 
I'm going to advance to the next slide. Let's look at some of oh these ideas God. that we had here. You're kidding. Okay. No, we've got stuff here. So let's 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 read some of our stuff. Okay. Uh, so one the one concept was, was you know they should have a love at first sight situation. You know they have some kind of instant connection, perhaps even telepathic, though they're both surprised and think surely not. Um, I would totally be okay with Galad uh, what Kelleborn looking at her and being intrigued. Um, I don't want to have a mutual connection between them at first. Mostly because I don't know, like I have to admit, I kind of want to play up a little bit to the situation that so many people, I mean, we've talked about this so many times over the years, right? You know, like one of the great mysteries is like, why does Gladro marry Kelborn in the first place, right? Like, what is it? Uh, you know, Hakan was just a, was just opining that in trying to give Gladro excuses for loving Kelborn, uh, uh, we're bound to fail uh, at doing that. And I, I know, I hear that, but then I, I kind of want to, I, I kind of want to, I kind of want to play on that actually, um, and to show them at the beginning to show him sort of, you know, he's on the sidelines, right? You know, he is like Kierden's right hand guy but he doesn't say much, you know, and he is like supporting cast for, for Kierden in that first meeting. And she is an important figure, right? She's a mover and a shaker and he's looking at her and she's a mover and a shaker and he admires her, but I think he might be a little, you know, perhaps a little wary, a little resistant. I think she shouldn't notice him at all. I mean, again, she'll see him again. She'll recognize him, but I, I, I don't think Galadriel emerges from that first meeting being like, who was that guy with Kierden? Like, I think he's pretty dreamy. Like, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think she has that kind of connection with Kelleborn off the top. Um, again, maybe, but I, I'm resistant to that. Um, I, I would like it to kind of grow more gradually than that. So anyway, so then, okay, so they spend time together at Merith Adderthod, and while looking at the ships in the harbor, Galadriel shares about the death of her mother. Yeah, okay. Kelborn reciprocates, right, by sharing his experience of loss. Does Gladio tell him of the kinslaying? If so, he honors her confidence. I'm not a fan of that. I'd like to have him find out a different way. Okay, so wait, what parts? I hear both of you. Uh, 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 oh, the more. latter part. I would rather Go not ahead. have Galadriel be the one telling about the kinslaying. I would rather have this conversation, you know, this sharing of the deaths and loss. But she leaves out the kinslaying part, and then he finds out about it from somebody else, and then looks over at her like, hmm, you know. I, I think, and I think my objections, uh, perhaps a little softer in that. I, I, I think I'd be okay with her telling him at some point, um, may, but maybe with some kind of external precipitator, like she's worried he's going to find out. I just, oh, that's true. I think, that's it, good. I think good. I'm more concerned with timing. I just want to make sure it, I want to make sure it happens at such a point where it doesn't happen immediately. I want to make sure that, that there are stakes when it happens, that we're worried. She, yeah, related. yes, I agree. I mean, I just don't see, I mean, I could see this conversation about the death of the mother and the loss of the hunter, but I would think this kinslaying thing is a big deal to Galadriel. And yeah. I'm not sure at this point she'd be comfortable having the, you know, telling this guy that, I mean, he's Sindar, you know, it's like, it's. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's way too soon for things to escalate to that point. I think we just, it, it's, it's, it strains I, credulity that she would does, confide yeah. in him so completely. The first part I could get though. Their first meeting. Yeah. The first part I could get because that's, that shows there's some degree of comfort in confiding yeah. with him. Right. Yeah. But not. And in that sense, that's the sense in which I can see like a connection. Like she yeah. finds herself like being comfortable with him in a way that she can't fully explain. Right. Like she's, right. you know, she confides in him to an extent that she hasn't confided to anybody. She's not talked to anybody about the death of her mom yet. I mean, right. it's not like other people don't know about it, but she, you know, she has not ever worked through this with anybody else. She's been strong and she's been, you know, doing the leadership and the ambition thing. And she's not been going here. Right. Um, the one thing I would want to, uh, inter I, I still, I like the idea of Melian being the trigger. Like what, cause we, we, Galadriel needs to change. Like we, this is going to be her being withdrawn and upset and depressed and self-doubting is very different from where we've had her before. We, mm -hmm. I think we need a precipitating event to bring that about. And to me, the, like, she looks into the eyes of Melian and like, you know, is suddenly confronted with this. Uh, you know, this picture, we give an on-screen flashback, right, of her with, like, 
the blood of the Teleri sprayed on her, right? On the hey, I think she gets treated to an experience that she's going to then confer on others later. Yeah. Right? Oh, yes. You know? Oh, yeah. Where, like, she looks into Melian's eyes and Melian, like, envisions. Oh, that's yeah, so awesome. Yeah. The parallel with the Fellowship, right? She, yeah. like, she is tested by Melian at the. Yeah. Oh, yes. That is awesome. That is so cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now, um, uh, it's. Yes. Yeah, no, that's very cool. Um, and she comes away. She may come away from that a little bit like Boromir did. Yeah, yeah. You know? She's troubled like Boromir yeah. is troubled. Yeah, now, Melian is not reading her mind there, right? No. Uh, any more than uh, not reading her mind in the sense of like, uh, Melian would emerge from that knowing that Goadriel was traumatized, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing that there was, that there was, some mm -hmm. grief mm -hmm. there in the in, in other words which everyone else is going to figure out too before too long right as we talked about the Noldor aren't going to be able to hide the fact that like something bad happened right that's going to be one of the first things that's going to be known even if they don't talk about it everybody's going to know that something bad happened um so she got, right away comes with uh with what she with what she wants um so yeah no 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 uh so yeah, no, no, Nick, I'm not suggesting that Melian knows about the Kinsling. Yeah, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. no she no. doesn't read her like, mind. Right. She just like can see that she is troubled, and uh, and she uh, and Goadriel emerges from that shaken, and she herself has been she Goadriel herself has been led to like realizations. Like one of the things she realizes she just like she has not worked through this, and she is she has been in denial essentially about her own role, about her own culpability, um, about, uh, you know, the death of her mother and what that means to her about like what she should do. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Marie, exactly. Marie says a, you know, that it should be a, I see there is a darkness behind you kind of thing. Yes. She would perceive darkness. She would perceive grief. Melian would. And Galadriel would be like, yeah, I so don't want to talk about that right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but this is what then sets her into this kind of emotional tailspin, like right? this like spiritual and emotional tailspin. And and then she leaves. What's the have her leave? Uh Doria. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, because I like this this works with them with the with the Marath Adderthad. So so she she goes to Doriath, and when she first goes to Doriath, she's all like, Hey, I'm like representing the Noldor. I'm I'm the uh, you know, I'm 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 all that. I'm an important person. I'm going to, I'm going to negotiate, you know, a relationship with the Sindar here. And then she meets Melian and this whole thing falls apart. Right. She goes into a tailspin. She leaves. We want to send her over to Finrod. This is how she ends up living with Finrod for a little while. We show him, we show her with him before the, Mar to the Marath Adarthad, right? This is why she's not setting up a realm on her own because she's, she's troubled and she's just living with her brother and Finrod's worried about her. Right. So we can, we can have one short scene in which we establish that Finrod is concerned about Goadriel, that something is obviously not right and she's changed and he, you know, uh, and everything. And do we also have like a, um, uh, comparison in her experience of living with Finrod versus her experience of having been in Doriath with Melian. In other words, there's something about being in Doriath that was that was a balm to her that she's that being with Finrod is not, and it's that's one of the things that propels her back. Yeah, exactly. Well, see, it can be meeting Caliborn at the Marath Adarthad. That's right? true. So that's between true. Between yeah, her first trip to Doriath and the Marath Adarthad, she's living with Finrod, right? Right. And like you know, kind of in retreat, and she's not talking to anybody, and Finrod is worried, right? But mm -hmm. he brings her to the Marath Adarthad, and she's like, you know not she's not the life of the party right she's off and so we can have this scene where Kelborn approaches her Kelborn sees her grief and Kelborn approaches her he sees that she, he's shocked by the chase so this is where he's shocked right right he's heard the marathon or thought and he's like dude she's changed right mm -hmm. um this is not the the you know the 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 confident mover and shaker i met when i first met the nolder back in episode one or whatever right so so he goes <laughs> up to her and they have this conversation and she shares about the death of her mother but she doesn't share about the kinslaying yet. And, but he can tell there's more, but he doesn't push, right? So we show him being friendly. We show him being a good listener. Um, and she chooses to go back to Doriath after this, right? Not with him or anything, right? It's not mm -hmm. like, let's move in together or something like that. But uh, um, 
he goes back to Doriath. So we see, so she arrives then afterwards. And mm-hmm. part of what is drawing her back is Melian, perhaps, but part of uh, what draws her back is Kelborn, right? Kelborn is also and, there. And right? it could even not be, reg- uh, she may not even really understand what's drawing her back. She just knows she's being drawn back. Like that's where she'd prefer to be. Right. She may not right. really know yet. Exactly. Yeah. She, she doesn't have to have reasons, but right. it would make sense for her, for, for those, for both of those reasons. So both right. Celeborn and Melian would be her two connections, her two draws back and right. we can show that happening. Yeah. Now, now Ellen, don't worry about the Nolder council. That's going to happen and we can have Angrod at it and everything. It's just not what we're talking about today. Uh, that's why I'm not talking about, it. I'm not talking. To, so keep in mind, Ellen, that when I don't we're under strict, discuss we're under things, instructions, yeah, it doesn't mean that we're not, it doesn't mean we're skipping them. It just means I'm not talking about them today, right? We're not trying to do the whole story, just the Galadriel and Kelborn story, because I'll get in trouble if we don't. So, um, <laughs> so, okay, so so she goes back. So this is what brings her back to Doriath. And then at Doriath, I kind of, I would like for her to tell Celeborn about the kinslaying before anybody else knows about it and for him to honor her confidence. I like that. Um, I also I, can, I also like that. Um, I, I think like just not I right away. That, I think that would be a really important moment uh, <clears throat> in their relationship where you yeah. know that he he needs to be convinced that she um, that you know he needs to be convinced of sort of some combination of her innocence and her rehabilitation. You know, that, that he doesn't, that his first reaction, like essentially we need to have laid the groundwork for his response to be compassion and understanding, uh, not, not, you know, sort of like a a, a knee jerk um, react, uh, move toward just, you know, a demand for justice or something. So that's that's my only concern. I also don't want him to be portrayed as so besotted with her that he doesn't have some have to think this through for himself yeah. he honors her confidence but not like right in the second yeah He's exactly mad. yeah He's like yeah, i totally agree with that has to really think about it i yeah, think what I, I think that may um, let me just finish i'm sorry dave i apologize oh, no, you go ahead go ahead go ahead sorry, i'll forget please. um one of the things that will i think would make him decide to honor her confidence is the change he's seen in her is right. that's mm-hmm incredible difference and he sees that she's in so much pain anyway that's all i wanted to say dave go ahead yeah i was gonna say i i think this would be in some ways be more compelling if it's if it's when he's still in friend zone yes yes Yes. i agree i agree well i mean especially where and this is where this is of course where it's not like you know when harry met sally or something like that (laughs) because we're talking like she is traumatized right you know this She's not, this is, you know, like, uh, uh, she is not looking at him as like, and asking the question, like, is this guy boyfriend material or not? Like that's it's not so even close to being in her mind. Yeah. 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 So off the radar screen. Yeah. Um, and you know, th- when they like, again, uh, Trish, I really love the, uh, Eowyn Faramir parallel, uh, again, extended over a longer time it works really well it's right. only when just as eowyn only sort of confronts her own heart towards faramir or only realizes her own heart towards faramir mm-hmm. when she herself embraces healing as well right those two mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. they're simultaneous for her like that, that that is part of her healing and i would think that this, we, we can do we, we do a similar thing with galadriel right it's not it's not on the um it's not on the now it, again. Obviously, the difference there is that with Eowyn, part of her problem in the first place, right, is her fixation on Aragorn, right. um, and her disappointment uh, at Aragorn being not into her, right, um, and how that's all wrapped up with her ambitions about herself and her image of herself, and and, well, uh, and all yeah, that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, she's got like daddy slash uncle issues in the sense of her place in the society and all that stuff too, right? Right, right, exactly. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, so... Um, uh, this is really yeah. interesting, actually. You know, the other thing for me is, is similar to Faramir and Eowyn, Eowyn, it seems to me, this, and this this is probably really obvious, Celeborn knows before she does, just like Faramir does. You know, he, yes. he yes. loves her before she realizes she loves him. The yes. other thing that I think is interesting about this is that, you know, it's kind of... I up till I don't 
I don't even know if up till now, but I know there was a time when we used to talk about, you know, Gladwell wanted to roll a room of her own, you know, and mm-hmm. all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And then, th- then she went and she set up Lorian. Well, but it's not a straight line. The no. Gladrail who who with Kelleborn founds Lorian is not the same Galadriel who wanted to rule a realm of her own. This is where right. the change happens. And it's just right. really interesting to me because the foundation of Lorien is very different. This is a very different Galadriel, you know? Yes. So I yes. like that. I think that's cool. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. And uh, Ellen, that's exactly right. You know, she's preoccupied with her t- turmoil and realizes mm-hmm. things later. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, okay, cool. So the moment I think for Celeborn, if we're going to give Celeborn the moment where, where he sort of commits himself to her, mm-hmm. that moment is when he conceals the kinslaying from thinking, yes, honoring I agree. her confidence, right? I agree. That's when we see he's committed to her. After um, thinking about it. After. Yeah, exactly. So he's going to have this moment of crisis right right she's going to confess to him and then he's going to be like well crap <laughs> now now what do <laughs> now i do, what do, I do? <laughs> right? thingle kind of needs to know this is a little bit important right this is uh i but i can't betray her personally right. you know and so when he makes the decision i'm not gonna tell thingle um mm-hmm. that's when he's he's chosen he her. makes the commitment yeah 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 and again he, and he doesn't say anything to her you know, she's she's no. not a part of that discussion. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I I envy the script writer. I don't envy the script writers. And how are we going to show that? You know, how are we going to show that? But you know, I'm an executive producer, so I'm yeah. don't have to really spend too much time thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sorry, Nick. Exactly. Sorry, Marie. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, Ellen asks, does Thingle ever find out Kelborn did that? I say I was wondering yes. the same thing. Yes. You think? I, th- I think, well, here's here's my idea for, like, the rest of the rough outline of their relationship, right? What so Celeborn gets kicked out of Doriath? Well, I think there should be some kind of tense moments, but I actually, so I don't want to make Thingol just, like, a bad guy, right? I, 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 I don't, I don't want to, there, there there would be a... Yet. We don't want to make him a bad guy yet. Reason. Yes, exactly, for that reason, right? Um, He needs to have a a more gradual sort of fall. Decline, like, he can't just yeah. be a jerk from the beginning. Um, And... Anyway, but we can see seeds of jerkness, maybe in his reaction. Right. Yes, exactly. Uh, there will be problems that we, are, we can see growing to uh, to bigger <laughs> to bigger problems. Um, and you're right, Phil. We do need we do need uh, uh, somebody to translate "oh crap" into Cinderin if we're going to deliver that. <laughs> right now, but anyway, sorry. Okay, so um, <laughs> um, I do uh, think okay. you know, and I one of the things that I was wondering actually when we, it's funny, it's interesting. Alan brought that up because I was thinking to myself in his thinking about what he's going to do, whether he's going to keep her confidence or not, it has to be a thought of what are the consequences if Fingal finds out that I've right, you know that I've kept I mean, it, but and he chooses to anyway, kind of yes, thing. Yes, you know? exactly. He knows there could be consequences, and he like right. deservedly like he realizes right. this is a big deal, and that he right. is he is in the place where he has to he cannot be true to it both, right? You know, he cannot, he cannot do to do with Thingol what he should do. Um, Cause he knows that Thingol really should know this. Right. Um, but he knows that it would be a betrayal personally of Galadriel if he does. You know, so, I got to just say again, back to the script writing, this is going to be tough because a lot of this is inside his head. Is he going to have to have a confidant to talk to? I mean, how's he going to, uh, how are we going to know? Yeah, I was thinking that same question too. Uh, uh, Kierdan? <laughs> okay. What we need is for him to, uh, to sing a solo number, <laughs> in which he expresses all of these doubts and concerns. Or a Hamlet like monologue, right? Yeah. Like, all he needs is a soliloquy. Yeah. Is that so much to ask? Galadriel um, or not Galadriel? That is the question. Yeah. Um, but the, and the problem is, if he's got this, and he to have a confidant that well, blows the gaff because now he's right. he Nick can go the, hypothetically to a friend. He's so friend. What if yes. this is just theoretical? But what if? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lincoln says he really likes Asking the idea of 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 having Caliborn as a Disney princess. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> we have him do, and and if we have visual parallels, right? Uh, uh, with the uh, "Let It Go" sequence from Frozen, I oh, think it's Lordy. perfect. Lordy. Perfect. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm, I'm you know, that might be I'm something kidding. we need to revisit. I, I should. 
Or the, I would well, love to hear what the scriptwriters like, you know, I mean, not right now, but. Right. It, well, actually, it, Nick has a suggestion. Nick's oh. suggestion is that he's going to have to talk this through in some sense with Galadriel herself, which could happen. Like, it would not be a bad thing for her to realize. The not, position then, she's put him into. Right. Not yet romantically, but like mm-hmm. for him to, for her to understand the full significance of like, he is going to make the decision. Okay. Not no, to. I can see that. And, I and, and that. I agree. Ellen was also talking earlier on about saying, we don't want to make Goadriel just like foolishly blurted out. Right. right. She has to feel right. like you can trust him. And so right. it's, um, so actually having them kind of talk it through in some way explicitly right. you know, and, and him tell her, I will honor your confidence. And, and even to say things like, this is kind of a big deal. And I like, but I, I, I promise I will honor your confidence. And I think um, having yeah. seen talent of, of people like Martin Freeman and others who can say, uh, you know, a, a novel in one look, we yeah. could see the moment of his commitment just in his face. You know, you get the right, right. actor. Who, are, who, right. who did we cast for Caliborn? I don't remember, but anyway, I hopefully forget. he's got that ability. Yeah. yeah I forget. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. I, I think I think having having that be part of the conversation with Goadriel makes sense to me. It's certainly the most efficient way to do it. We I think it's the only way you can do it, really. Thanks, Nick. I can sleep well tonight because I was going to worry about that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. No, Karita. That's a good point. Karita points out she could even be the one to bring up the cost to him. I mean, you know, yes, she could. That's as, true. As Karita says, she's not stupid. She knows this is a big ask, right? That like. If I tell you something like this is going to put you, you know, uh, or afterwards she could say it to him out of her pain and then go, Oh my God, what have I done? Right. You know, what kind of position have I put you in? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we'll have to see what, you know, when the, when, she when we're actually oh, doing crap the same moment. they think. Yeah, exactly. We, get well, a, we, need, yeah. we need, Oh crap. And Quenya as well. then. All these complicated linguistic needs that we have. <laughs> Um, but yeah, okay, cool. So anyway, so here, here's my thought about sort of the later outline. So they meet again in Doriath. She, so she goes to Doriath, they meet again. She, they, 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 she, she gains confidence in him. She like, so he becomes a listener, you know, for her, they, you know, they, 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 they're like firmly in the friend zone. She, uh, she confesses the kinslaying to him. He's the first of all the Sindar to hear about the kinslaying, but he promises not to tell anybody. Um, and not just like a, and actually we could kind of play on this, right? Um, this shouldn't just be him being trapped in a rash vow. He shouldn't be like, I swear I shall tell no one whatever it is that you're about to tell me. And then afterwards he's like, well, now I'm stuck abiding by this vow, which oh, is going to yeah, create lots of problems for me. I think that we should play with that actually and have him not do that. Like, or have him have her bind him to no vow or, or um, um, right. Yeah, exactly, Ellen. I think Galadriel would be disturbed by vows, and she wouldn't want that. Uh, anyway, but again, I, I think we can actually play on that. How he makes the, and it would be a bigger testimony to him, right? If he, if he uh, honors her confidence, not because he's trapped himself into doing that uh, by a vow, but because because he chooses. Um, he, she leaves him free to do what he thinks is right, and he mm-hmm. chooses to not tell. This is, I think that would, be, that would be an awesome scene. I yeah. think this, this has the makings of a really awesome yeah. scene. Yeah, yeah. And, Ellen, exactly. That's just what I'm thinking. He offers to promise or starts mm. to promise, and she stops and him. And she stops him. Don't, yeah. don't, don't swear. Like, don't, don't. It's like, no, I've had enough oaths. Yeah. No, no oaths, oaths please. <laughs> uh, I want That's to leave you. <laughs> I, I want to leave you free to do what, you know, right. to, to do what you think is best. Not what yeah, you're I mean, she could even say, I, I don't, I don't want another oath on my head. I, yeah. I don't want another yeah. oath on my shoulder, the burden of another oath. The burden on of my another shoulder. oath. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, no, that's great. Okay. So again, Al, I keep, I keep not getting any further than this. So no, this is good. This is good. Then, great. then like Thingol starts finding out, right. Um, and how does he find out? Through Kierden, we, we, we have that. I mean, uh, Kierden tells him, um, and Kierden has found out in large part because of Sauron uh, and what's going on with the bag. Oh, right, right, Sauron right. has helped to to spread these right. rumors and to, and to figure right. this out. We we're, we'll work that out in more detail. We talked about this a little bit last time, yeah. but we'll work it out in more detail when we when we do the bad guys uh, plot. But anyhow, right. so he finds out. Um, I think so. Then we need to have a moment 
where he does find out that Kelleborn knew, right? Um, <laughs> so we have that conversation between Thingol and Kelleborn, where Thingol is like, Kelleborn, holy cow, I've got, now we need holy cow in, in, Sindar, in uh, uh, Sindarin as well. Holy cow, I've got like sh <laughs> the most shocking, brace yourself. Kelleborn, are you sitting down? Because I have shocking news for you. And then he tells him, and Kelleborn is like, yeah, I've known that for like decades, basically. And, um, uh, and he's kind of shocked, right? Uh, Thingol is shocked that he knew about it. Um, what would Thingol do? I mean, he'd be mad, but I wouldn't want him just to be, you know, again, I don't want him just to be, I, I, I don't make Thingol one-dimensional. Um, I think he'd be angry, but what would he do? Would he be understanding? Because, I mean, here's the reality of the situation. There's a certain parallel. I mean, there are lots of non-parallels as well, but there's a, Thingol married up too. <laughs> right? I mean, like, let's be honest. Uh, so I think that he would perhaps see some of that. He could even establish that parallel. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Um, uh, Melian has to be involved in this scene. Does she defuse it? Um... I don't want him banished. I don't want Kelborn banished. I don't want I don't want Thingol to be like to have a hair trigger for banishing people. Um, Maybe Thingol sends him on an impossible mission. <laughs> right. <laughs> sends him on an impossible mission in which he's almost certain to die. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This could be, this could be his uh, his like uh, his prototype. Uh, no, obviously, obviously the, the things that the stakes aren't that high. So no, he's not going to do that. Um, yeah. um, it is very interesting because so like I certainly think maybe his initial reaction is kind of that like like thingle angry silence thing mm -hmm. um, where he just doesn't say anything and walks out or something like that. Well, and he, he but it is kind of like I don't know what the follow up would be because uh, I agree that like like. Basically, it seems like we're we, we're faced with a choice between things that seem like hair trigger overly harsh and things that seem uncharacteristically soft for him. Right, right. Well, here's another factor. Just thinking about Thingol's reaction to the kin slaying news in general. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, the ban is a big deal, clearly. However, yeah. if you think about it, it's a fairly moderate response really, right? I mean, yeah. notice what Thingol does not do when he finds out about the Kinslaying, right? He does not say, declare war on the Noldor. He does not say, any Noldor who steps into Doriath will be instantly killed, right? Um, like, you are our enemies. You are no better than the orcs. You slew the, you are worse than the orcs because they at least were not guilty of betrayal as well as murder. You know, I mean, there's lots of scope for ways that Thingol could have handled that way worse than he did, right? Um, so what if we see him working through... Uh, exactly, Ellen. He does not declare a blood f uh, uh, feud and go invade Himring. That's precisely what he doesn't do. Um, what if we see him working through this with Celeborn and even Celeborn himself being a kind of model, right? Thingol's first reaction to the news of the kinslaying is like he is shocked and appalled. The Noldor are in fact our enemies. Like this cannot be born, right? Is Thingol's first response, and his impulse uh, might be violent, right? Like we, like we, we might, you know, okay. So the children of Fenarfin are not personally guilty. We won't, but we're declaring war on the Fanorians, right? It's over. Like that's it. Um, if this is their fault, and they did this, and we won't forgive them. His confrontation with Celeborn, of course, and then Celeborn is going to come in for a bunch of that anger. You know, he, he would naturally cha channel a bunch of that anger that he's already feeling towards Celeborn, who now seems culpable, you know, to be on the side of his enemies, essentially, right? But G Celeborn's pity for Galadriel and his compassion for Galadriel's situation can then be the thing, as Celeborn sort of testifies to that, can be the thing that helps to moderate with assistance and support from Millian um, to moderate Thingol's 
perspective, right? To say like, okay, hang on, Thingol, this is not that simple, right? This is not, to, they're not in fact worse than orcs. This is more complicated than that. Um, look at Galadriel, right? Look at the impact this has had on her. You can see, if you look at the Noldor, this doesn't just explain the untold things in their background that we never figured out. This also explains some other things, right? Why are the Noldor so haunted? Why are they so troubled? Um, why, why is like, why are the Noldor people as a whole so wounded, right? So broken as a people uh, that there's, there's serious trouble here, right? And yes, they did horrible things, especially the Feanorians, but they also are deserving of our pity and compassion, right? So Celeborn speaks from his own experience with Galadriel, um, defends his choice to not tell Thingo about it because of honoring Galadriel's confidence and her own experience and his experience of hearing from her helps to temper Thingol's response. So in the end, he's like, okay, I'm not going to say it's okay. I'm not pretending it's okay, right? He's not going to really truly forgive them, but he's not going to make it worth, worse. He's not going to step in. And so he decides to go with the ban, which is, as I say, when you think about it, still a fairly moderate response. Um, yeah, Ellen, in a sense, what I'm thinking, if you think about that scene in the speeches that Thingol makes to Angrod and Finrod in that scene in the Silmarillion, what I would kind of like to do is sort of split that up. I mean, we get one speech from Thingol in which it sort of expresses the whole thing in, you know, classic Silmarillion storytelling mode, right? We get the whole thing in one speech there. We don't have to do it that way, and I wouldn't want to do it that way, especially with this extra wrinkle with, again, the Kelborn and Galadriel thing. We're kind of teasing this out a little bit more, and I think that we can afford to do that. So, so Ellen, my thought there is, again, we don't lose any of that interaction, but we split it up. His first, The harsh things, Ellen, that he says in that scene, uh, uh, you know, I marvel at you that you come, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, stained with your mother's blood, all, all that kind of thing, right? He says that those things. So his first response is anger, and he like you know he like kicks them out you know he they they leave um i don't necessarily mean they leave doriath right away but they leave like the room right he 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 uh makes them leave his presence uh and he then goes to melian and he goes to 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 Caliborn, and then they have this discussion at which point he emerges moderated not over it right not reconciled to it not uh totally forgiving the Noldor, but moderated. And then he calls Finrod and Angrod back to him and says some of the other things that he says, right? And that's when he, he like decrees the ban and he sends them to go and tell the rest of the Noldor about the ban. Um, yeah, Nick, I think that's a really neat point. Nick says, uh, you know, a, a sort of elvish perspective that murder harms the slayer more than the slain. Yeah, um, yeah. When you're immortal, that's totally true, right? when you're human and you're talking about murder, the consequences for the victim, pretty extreme, right? Hard to say, sure, the murder victim was hurt, but the murderer was hurt even more, right? Hard to make that argument, really. You can talk about how the murderer is also hurt by a murder, right? No question about that, I think. But it's hard to make the argument that the murderer is actually worse off than the victim. You can do it, right? Boethius does it, and I can go along with him when he says it. But, um, but for for the elves, it's different, right? Um, it's not that the murder victim is not affected by it, right? Isn't it's not like it has no impact on them, but it's not the same either. And I think that you can. Nick, maintain the argument. It's, or rather, I should say, it's much easier to maintain the argument that the 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 effect that the choice to commit murder has on the murderer for an elf is actually worse and more profound than the experience of being murdered is for the victim. Immortal creatures, after all. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, Tony, we do see Thingol's response and restraint as part of the reconciliation thing. Well, it's it's again part of working out the whole reconciliation and forgiveness thing, right? Um, and this is where I think this can be really powerful. Thingol is willing to reconcile with the Noldor uh, on reflection. Is willing to reconcile with the Noldor uh, with conditions, right? And the ban is his condition. Um, the ban is therefore, in his eyes, a kind of group mea culpa on the part of the Noldor, right? If they are willing to give up their language and to and to, and to, and to speak only Sindar, if they 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 then this shows that they are accepting their guilt, that they are, you know, this is this is a sign of where they stand on this, uh, and those who who do speak Quenya are shall be considered, you know, slayers of kin, uh, unashamed. So. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, um, so yeah. Whereas, okay, sorry, I, I, I lost my train of thought, but I remember it now. Um, so Tony, it's with Galadriel and Caliborn that we get the fullness of Caliborn. Like, Thingol is willing to reconcile with the Noldor conditionally. Right, Celeborn forgives Galadriel, and then in the final step, Celeborn helps Galadriel to forgive herself. Um, so back to my overall outline of uh, the story. So after, then Thingol finds out finds out that Celeborn knew. In the wake of this, when tensions are super high, when Thingol is still kind of steaming about this, this is kind of when I think they should get married. I, I think it should be a, a kind of a brave statement by Celeborn. I think that Galadriel should... Well, okay, here's here's a question. Thinking only, thinking not about how it interacts with the outside story, thinking only of Galadriel and Celeborn personally themselves. We've gotten them to her confession to him, his choice to honor her confidence, the later stage then would be so then he forgives her, which doesn't doesn't happen instantly, right? I mean he can be kind of upset about the kinslaying thing, right? And he can have a problem with that, but he he forgives her, and then final step, he helps her to forgive herself and move past it, right? And when that's then her Aowen moment, right? When she forgives herself as he has forgiven her, then that's when she. Uh, turns and they love each other and they decide that they're going to get married, right? Um, so here's so here's my question. My question is, um, so Trish and Dave, or and everybody else, when does that breakthrough happen? Her forgiving herself, her having her breakthrough, and then afterwards, you know. Uh, realizing that she loves Celeborn and that, you know, how good he has been to her and uh, her respect and gratitude to him. Should that happen before or after the ban? Should they already be in that place? Should they already be like essentially betrothed or something when Thingol finds out? I kind of like, see, Here's the thing that I'm kind of toying with. I like the image of Thingol, of uh, Celeborn, basically going to... Th so Thingol is furious. Not just at Celeborn. Thingol is like, oh, Noldor, all oh, these Noldor, right? And Celeborn is like, um, this is probably a good time to tell you that I'm, I'm going to marry, marry you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, basically, I, I, I like the idea of Celeborn taking... A, of him making a stand, right? Um, and being therefore a force for pushing along reconciliation and pushing towards forgiveness between the Sindar and the Noldor. Um, yeah. Um, so the question I guess becomes, have they already, have they already reached the, you know, like have they done all of the sort of the personal reconciliation work before yes. the ban or, or or do, or is it maybe in in progress and then it happens after the ban? Maybe the ban kind of like, com in some sense, the ban 
propels Celeborn onward um, almost right. defiantly. Right, right. Yeah, that, that spirit of defiance in Caliborn here is one of the things that I really like there. The problem is I'm having a hard time seeing how it would interact with Galadriel's own internal struggle, right? Because um, again, the, the, the turning point there, the pivot is her own coming to grips with it, like her own choice to forgive herself and to move on. Um, uh, and can we, can we, once again, can we, um, is it possible that maybe we, we do these things in separate stages where, uh, like the Galadriel self forgiveness part happens earlier, maybe even before their romantic relationship begins. Right. Yeah, it would. It's, it and would. then, and then the, and then the romance, and especially the, um, the sort of public announcement via betrothal, like happens um, after the ban. Right. That the betrothal thing, I kind of so, <clears throat> Goadriel's living in Doriath, which in the immediate wake of the ban is going to be awkward, right? Um, Angrod and Finrod go. And they, you know, they 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 go to tell the rest of the Noldor about this. Then there's going to be the question: So is Galadriel going to leave too? Right? Is she? Does she going to go with her brothers? That that could be the thing, the moment that pushes things to like pushes her to the realization: No, I really, actually, I I, I don't want to leave Celeborn, right? Um, and which, which also pushes him to say to her, he will have never approached her in like a romantic way, right? Um, he's only been friend and counselor and confidant to her. Um, when she's confronted with the question, okay, Thingol is mad at like all of my kin and I get it and I, I respect that, I guess I should go to have that be the moment when Celeborn um, says to her, I don't want you to go. I want you to stay. Um, and when she realizes that she would like to stay. Yeah, exactly. Alan. So that would be the moment when she chooses to, to, to remain in Doriath. Um, so that would be like their, their betrothal essentially. And then we would celebrate their, their marriage later on. Um, and that would actually give a really nice, that would, the wedding of, Goadriel and Celeborn would then be a really nice kind of framing structure with the Merith Adarthad, right? Which is the sort of feast of theoretical reconciliation among the Sindar and the Noldor, but we know there's lots of uh, unresolved issues there. And Galadriel's own st emotional struggles are like the embodiment of those issues, right? That are not yet worked out. So when Galadriel has worked through those issues and Celeborn has forgiven her and they have joined together and they're being married at the end, it's like the Merith utter thought as it was meant to be, right? And it kind of frames that, um, you know, the, the time when they first met to the time when they're married, the initial overtures at reconciliation, which were still based on false premises because there was not honesty and understanding between the Sindar and the Noldor. And, you know, the uh, the sort of more perfect reconciliation between them. Now, again, still not perfect in the sense of everybody going along with it. I don't mean that. Um, but to sort of show how it could really work, how it how it actually how it actually happens. Um, so that would put their betrothal at like basically precipitated by the ban. When the crisis and the crisis point would be: Does she leave or not? Um, and that 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 makes sense to me as a driving force. And so then after that, um, it would also mean that it would be right in the wake of the ban that Celeborn would be telling Thingol, "Oh yes, yeah, so, and I'm actually gonna gonna marry her. I hope uh, you know. I hope that's okay. Um, you're not gonna banish us, are you, or something like that? Um, yeah, yeah." Yeah, Ellen, it could totally could be an episode after the ban. I'm not saying we have to squeeze it in the same episode. I'm not. We're not uh, not necessarily outlining episode by episode here. Just kind of thinking of sequence, and then we'll put these things. Uh, uh, we'll 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 move these things into sequence as we go through. Um, okay, that outline works for me. Does that does that not seem to make sense? Ooh, good question, Ellen. What is Celeborn's sister's reaction? We did want to bring in a sister to Celeborn. 
Uh, she's going to be a green elf. She's going to be involved in the dwarf plot. No, and she's going to be the one who's the spokesperson with the, no, it's the human plot. She's going to be the one who is the, uh, the spokesman friend uh, of the humans. Um, she'll be at the wedding. I don't think we need to give her a strong opinion. <laughs> Green elves don't seem to have strong opinions about too much. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't think we need to show her disapproving or anything like that. I don't, I don't see that really clearly. Um, yeah. Okay, Zach, you're right. They do have strong opinions about dwarves. <laughs> But those are still developing. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Um, well, and I guess, you know, uh, Zach, you could say, just say the same thing the other way around. They have strong opinions about trees, right? Uh, clearly. Um, her feeling about reconciliation and forgiveness towards the Noldor. Well, I mean, Ellen, it brings up a really interesting question, right? Um, the kinslaying is not really just a Sindar Noldor issue, though that's how we're primarily treating it. Um, it's really a, um, it's really a, you know, a Teleri Noldor issue. And so the Green Elves have every bit as much reason for grievance as the Sindar. But the thing is, is that since they don't have, um, since they don't have, um, the same again. One of the one of the one of the reasons in which, reflecting on what I just said about the green elves not having strong opinions about anything, one of the reasons I think that I say that, uh, is that they don't have it. Like again, we don't get any characters. We don't get any green elf care. Nobody, apart from that one unnamed green elf who talks to Finrod about the humans coming into Beleriand, we get. That's the only line of dialogue we get from a green elf for the entirety of the rest of the Silmarillion, right? We do, like we know almost nothing about what they're thinking and what they're doing, um, apart from hanging out in Osirian and helping Baron. I mean, again, like they're involved in vague and unnamed ways, helping Galadriel and or uh, helping Luthien and Baron, um, uh, and all that. But but again, we like they don't have a personality um, in that sense. Um, uh, and so I agree, Alan. It's the nice thing about having Kelleborn's sister there is that um, we uh, we do we we have the opportunity to give them a personality. Um, I would say, in general, that the Green Elves are less involved because they just seem more withdrawn, right? Like they. Um, and I, I would want to frame this in a positive way rather than in a negative way. That is to say, it's not that they don't care about what's going on in Beleriand and in Valinor and all these other things. It's that they care more about what's going on in Middle Earth. Remember, these are the, these are the followers of Lenway, right? These are the these are the the people who peel off from the uh, trip to Valinor and the way that we did this. And I really loved what we did with this in season two. Um, they did this not again, not for negative reasons because they weren't into Valinor decided they just kind of rather not the reason they peeled off and stayed was because of their positive commitment to middle earth, because they answered, you know, Arwen's question, the question we gave to Arwen in the frame of season two, what is the true home of elves? Is that, you know, what is the true home and purpose of elves? Is it in Middle Earth or is it in Valinor? The Green Elves answer is of all of the elves most emphatically in Middle Earth, right? In a sense, even more than the Avari, uh, because the Avari's reason for not going was not, was, was more negative, right? We don't trust these guys. We don't want to go there. We don't want to leave. Um, the Avari in that sense made a negative choice as evidenced in their name, right? The unwilling, right? That's what's how they are identified. Um, so they made a negative choice. The Green Elves didn't make a negative choice. They didn't just say, we don't want to go. They made a positive choice. We want to be here. So that is the one sort of core conviction of the green elves that we have. And so I would want to stay true to that. When we're thinking about Celeborn's sister's character, um, I would want to stay true to that and show that. So 
I think that she and the rest of the Green Elves, by extension, would be less invested in the politics of Beleriand. Again, not for negative reasons, not because they don't care or can't be bothered, but because it's irrelevant to what they are primarily focused on, right? Um, uh, the, uh, which is the affairs of Middle Earth and the and the blessing and development of Middle Earth, um, and yet they would be troubled by the kinslaying. And, and I mean, again, it 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 clearly affects them too. Um, but um, uh, uh, but anyway, yeah, yeah, that's uh, um, they would move past it sooner, I think. Um, because it's, um, yeah, I don't know. Again, it's, it's just, it's not where they're, uh, it's not like they have kind of, they turned away from, uh, they were willing to leave behind everything else, all of their kin, right? Um, earlier on. Um, yeah, Nick, I, uh, Nick says like Tom Bombadil, they're more concerned with what's happening in their immediate realm. Yeah, yeah, more of a more of a Tom Bombadilian perspective. I think it's a good way to think about it. Actually, um, they're less concerned, and therefore they would even be less concerned with things like that's why they're less concerned with the war against Morgoth, right? Um, you could make you could say to the Green Elves, "Oh, but aren't you concerned that like the you know the 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 enemy of all is you know." encroaching nearby and there's like evil going on just outside your borders and aren't, don't you want to, uh, you know, uh, um, don't you want to uh, lend a hand towards that? But again, you could say the same thing with Tom Bombadil and the Barrow Whites, right? What, like, Tom, aren't you concerned that there's all of this, you know, these hostile evil creatures living right outside your borders? Um, <laughs> right, Ellen, of course, yes, unlike Tom Bombadil, they also threaten to kill visitors uh, who don't follow their rules when they come into their terrain. So yes, they're not exactly like Tom Bombadil, and I'm not, of course, suggesting that uh, Caliborn's sister goes around singing about the color of her own clothing, but um, but, but Nick, I, I think your point is really well taken. Like they, they are in that sense, kind of living more, uh, it's like living in the now, except they're living in the here <laughs> instead of the now, right? Thinking of it spatially instead of temporally. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, tra la 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 down in the valley. Yeah. That's more like the song that they, that they sing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Down in the valleys. Exactly. Oh, in the seven valleys. That's it. That's it. Um, yeah, good question. So let's say, hang on. I've got another slide here, don't I? Okay, oh, good. More suggestions. Shoot. That I forgot to read. Okay. Let's see. Uh, uh, right. Neither one fall in love at the beginning. Right. Um, okay. Right. Kel, weren't you not to say anything? We, we did that. Uh, develop a partnership where they trust and understand each other. Sure. Yeah, again, uh, confidence, trust for each other should grow quickly. And by the way, just referring back to like the true, the, you know, love at first sight thing. Again, I don't want like, you know, slow-mo running across the fields to each other or anything. Um, the sense in which I think there could be some kind of connection or understanding between them is that they do come to feel they can trust each other relatively quickly and somewhat counterintuitively, honestly, right? Like what cause do they have to trust each other really? Um, that is where I would think the kind of mystery, which suggests that the two of them are meant for each other kind of thing can come in again, not in a sense of like romantic desire or sexual attraction or something like that. But, um, but that, you know, trust is comparatively quick and solid between the two of them. Um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. So. Oh yeah. Sorry. I was reading suggestions. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I don't know that Kelborn necessarily invite Galadriel, but again, I think that he is still a reason, even if perhaps an unconscious reason why she comes. Uh, I, I like that. Um, and yes, their marriage showing there can be peace and forgiveness between the Sindar and Noldor. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That they, they become sort of the model, right? They're the kind of aspirational model of how things could work out in Beleriand. Um, they're a sign of hope. 
ultimately, right? Um, that yes, okay, there's the doom of Mandos, and it's you know things are not looking great for the Noldor, but this is possible. Forgiveness is possible. Moving past this is possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Oradreth's marriage adds Hakan. <laughs> Hakan, I'm totally not talking about Oradreth today. I, I don't care. It's not happening. <laughs> Someday we will talk about Oradreth and figure out whose kitty is. But it is not this day. <laughs> it is not this day. Um, yeah. Yeah. And when we do, when we do, we will relate it back to the Gladriel and Kelleborn story because it's totally relevant. But we're not talking about that today. Um, uh, however, I do want to double back a little bit and think in terms of um, uh, to think in terms of the um, the larger plot. So, Ellen, I want to come back to Angrod a little bit and see how I can just I, the, the shape of how I can see that working because I don't think I don't think it presents too many challenges. So, again, looking from a large plot overview perspective here, right? Galadriel undertakes for herself to go to Doriath and help solve the political problems, the potential political problems with the Sindar, right? Instead, she has this moment of crisis when she looks into Melian's eyes uh, and she ends up like Boromir when Boromir looks into her eyes. Though the situations aren't parallel and uh, Melian doesn't know what's in her thoughts exactly. But anyway, crisis, as we described. She goes and lives with her brother. She doesn't even really report back to Fingolfin. She, you know, she gives up on the whole thing. She uh, uh, gives over her aspirations. That's when Angrod then is sent, right? So Angrod gets sent uh, by, you know, Finrod and Fingolfin. Um, and uh, in fact, we could even have that. Ooh, yeah, that would be a good way to move things along. I remember I was saying that we would want to have a moment where Finrod is expressing anxiety about his sister, right? Um, we can have her coming and living with Finrod. And then later we can have Finrod and Angrod and Fingolfin talking about like, this is, uh, this is not, or maybe just Angrod and, and Finrod. I kind of want to involve Fingolfin for Hakon's reason that I don't want to lose sight of him. Um, I want to. I want to have him. I'm going to give him more opportunities uh, to uh, uh, to show leadership. But anyway, um, whether Fingolfin is involved or not, it's in that context that Finrod can say, uh, you know, Goadriel's out. She's not going to be. In. We thought maybe she, you know, she volunteered to do this. I thought that was a cool idea. Uh, I thought she would be great at that, but she's she's out. She's uh, she's seriously troubled. Um, somebody else needs to do this. And then Angrod is appointed. So then Angrod goes uh, and Angrod goes to the, uh, uh, to Doriath and does his thing. And then he comes back and he reports to the, to the Noldor and, um, you know, Caranthir is upset and, and, you know, uh, says his angry things and stuff. Then we have the Marathad or Thad, which is the next step for Goadriel. Right. Um, so that all I think works perfectly fine. And then we have the ban. Um, and we talked about the ban wanting to kind of spread out that scene a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. I get, see, Ellen, you keep talking about decades. I, forget about decades. Don't think in terms of years. Don't think into all that matters is the sequence of events as we present them in the season. We don't have to even give clear ideas of how much time is passing until the times when we need to show cities being developed. There are lots of ways in which we can, it, again, it doesn't, I am so untroubled by the actual uh, the actual passing of of time. Um, we can handle that. We can make that. Um, and yet, Nick, exactly. That's the reason I'm thinking that way. The elves are certainly not. We might think we we might be tempted to think in terms of years or decades because Tolkien did timelines, right? And so we might think like, well, we have to be constrained by these timelines. I'm not worrying about the timelines at all. Certainly not in terms of like but X number of years have to pass between this event and this event compared to X number of years happening between this event and the other event. Again, if that, if there's a good reason for that, if we find that it, that really fits within our narrative and so, you know, for some reasons, or there are other things coming in that are happening in other plot lines that really necessitate some delay, then fine, we can do that. But I feel no, uh, absolute pressure, uh, to abide by those, uh, those year outlines. Um, so yeah, we just have to think about it in terms of uh, in terms of the um, uh, the events. Yeah. Um, well, 
sure Ellen the Crowning of Fingolfin can happen earlier on, but I'm not I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about the sequence with Doriath and Angra. Uh, <laughs> goodness, Ellen. Earlier on, I'm talking about uh, 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 Galadriel and Kelleborn, and you want me to talk about Angra. And now I'm talking about Angra, and you want me to talk about Fingolfin. It's all there. Yeah, it's fine. It can all happen. Um, yeah, yeah. So we'll 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 see uh, how that how that sequence of events works. Um, what I would like. What we're going to need uh, as we discuss these plot lines um, is we're going to need a sort of outline of events, like the sequence in which these events need to happen. And then once we have the sequences of all of these different events, right? So we just made an outline of the Galadriel and Caliborn thing. Now, again, not saying necessarily time is going to be passing at various points and perhaps more and perhaps less. Um, what matters is the uh, order in which they happen. And there are some things, of course, that we want to tie them to. Like we wanted to tie this one moment in the Gladio and Caliborn story with the Marath Adderthot. And we want to tie this other moment with the uh, the revelation of the Kinslaying and, and the ban, right? Um, but much of the rest of it can be kind of free floating. And again, the sequence at the beginning, I think there's 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 still a fair bit of flexibility that's uh, that's open to us. <laughs> <laughs> Phil wants us to make a um, to make a to make a Gantt chart of the first stage. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Something I don't know if a Gantt chart would be exactly it, but um, uh, <laughs> but something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. So we'll see. Um, <laughs> Ellen. You're worried about the 50 years. Again, stop worrying about the 50 years. Don't worry. Just don't worry about just deep breath and let the 50 years go. Because it's not about the 50 years. It's about the sequence of events. That's all that matters for our outlines, right? Uh, and don't worry. The selection of Fingolfin is going to happen at the beginning. That's going to be a very early thing, right? It's totally fine. It's totally fine. And we don't even have to say, does 50 years have to happen? Like a whole bunch, like Galadriel's decision to go and her going and meeting Melian and having a conflict and going to live with, with Finrod, that could all happen in like 18 months. Who knows? That could, that, that, could, that could happen in six weeks. I don't care. Like it doesn't matter. And we don't have to give any indication of the time that's passing there, right? If we don't want to, right? So um, it's all good. It's all good. Um, we, we, we just need to focus on the, uh, the outline of events. Um, Hakan suggests that Galadriel and Celeborn, uh, could go on a honeymoon through Balerion and its realms. <laughs> Hakan, it would be really funny to have Galadriel and Celeborn popping up. Uh, no, say, Hakan, where we need to have them popping up is in season five. Right, because season five would be like the extended honeymoon of Galadriel and Caliborn, right? Because you know that elves would go on a honeymoon for like a, a like a couple centuries, right? So, um, yeah, <laughs> Ellen, I'm sorry if my proposed order of event, events doesn't make any sense to you. Honestly, Ellen, I have to say I think that you're misunderstanding me. Um, I think you keep thinking I'm saying. I'm talking about things I'm not even talking. I'm trying to focus on a couple things, right? Remember, what we're doing now is not the master outline of the whole season. What we're doing now is each individual plot line. Then we will do the work of putting them together and forming one big episode, you know, one big outline where we will uh, uh, work through the episodes and stuff. That's what's going to happen, right? Um, so don't just deep breaths and don't worry about it right now because we're not there that's not even what i'm attempting to do it will all work trust me um so um uh yeah so how can exactly uh had uh, w whatever's going on in season five we have goadro and Caliborn popping up on their honeymoon tour uh, i really kind of love that uh we can we can use them in lots of uh in lots of uh uh, uh in lots of ways um yeah cool I'm sorry. Oh, and I don't mean to laugh. No one's made, you're talking about things like we've made a decision to get rid of what did somebody talk about getting rid of the council? Did that even come up? I, I'm, 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 you've totally lost me, Ellen. Uh, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not working with that. Oh, and Zach, you're so right. You're so right. We need to have, when we get the Tom Bombadil cameo, Galadriel and California should be visiting. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Remember? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, totally. Yeah. Them having tea. Um, uh, them the, them having tea with Galadriel and Celeborn. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, with Tom Bombadil, rather. Yeah. That totally needs to happen. Um, uh, yeah. Like a double date between uh, Tom and Goldberry and Galadriel and Celeborn. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, cool. So, um, Hakan, let's come back to your Fingolfin question because we still have a little bit of time. So I want to I want to I take just a little bit of time to think about that. We'll come back to this. We're going to be returning to the Noldor stuff uh, uh, a, a, a bit later on as well. But um, let's just pause for a second to brainstorm and think about ways in which Fingolfin is going to. I mean, just let's just start from basics. Things that Fingolfin is going to do in this season. Like what is Fingolfin, how is Fingolfin going to be involved? How do we keep him involved? Because there is, there are not very many things that he is himself going to do, right? I mean, okay, like get accepted as the high king of the Noldor. Yes. But even that's not exactly a thing he's, that's a thing that Mithros does really in a sense, right? Mithros uh, uh abdication, you know, his, his um, submission to Fingolfin that's really a Mithro story more than it is a Fingolfin story. Um, of course, obviously we have him involved and we're going to have him accepting that. And, but we need to show him acting as leader. We need to show him doing things. Um, maybe we think about this in terms of things we would not want having happen totally in his absence. Right? Hakan Turgan is a great example, right? Um, yeah, Ellen, you're right. He absolutely would be attending the wedding, right? Uh, Galadriel and Celeborn's wedding, absolutely. Um, yeah, he would be leading them, well, how do we see him being involved with the establishment of realms? I don't think, because see, here's the thing, is I kind of think he's going to be a little bit hands off. I don't see him being like, okay, I've looked at, I've, uh, I, I've, I, I have a map somehow, and uh, I've decided to break it up, right? So I'm going to say, all right, uh, Turgon, you get Nevras. Congratulations. Uh, uh, Finrod, I'm going to give you just like most of, like, like half of Beleriand, if that's okay with you. And I, I, I don't see him parceling up the, the land and, and, and deciding that kind of thing exactly. Um, I can see them kind of reporting back to him. I can see him kind of blessing their endeavors, but I don't see him, you know, drawing lines on a map and saying, you go here and you go there. Again, that just, it doesn't seem to me the way that Elvish leadership would really work necessarily. Um, nor do I think that those are particularly interesting scenes to show on screen, honestly. Um, or a particular, like, we need to show him as a leader. I don't think we need to show him as like a bureaucrat essentially. Um, uh, Tony, I can see a conversation between him and Mithros, private conversation after the public thing, right? Uh, I do think that Fingolfin and Mithros need a private conversation in which it's decided that the Feanorians are going to head east, Tony, as you suggest, right? Um, and where we see Fingolfin and Mithros having that sort of developing that understanding. Mithros will tell him honestly, um, my brothers aren't going to obey you, right? My, you know, at least some of my brothers, they're going to, they'll listen to me, but I don't think they're going to listen to you. And Fingolfin kind of acknowledging that and then kind of agreeing, all right, why don't you all head over to the East? Um, Francis, I agree that, um, I agree that he would be the one that others would naturally go to for advice and counsel. So let's think about that for a second. Where, who would need to consult Fingolfin and why during the course of this season? Um, 
Galadriel at the beginning to say, hey, I want to go to Doriath and try to set things straight. So we'd have a Galadriel Fingolfin conversation near the very beginning. We'd have that Mithros Fingolfin conversation. We definitely um, uh, Hakan need a Turgon conversation, right? Turgon would come and tell him about the vision. Maybe Turgon and Finrod both. Well, no, because they don't tell each other even. Maybe we would have private discussions between each of them. So he could talk to Finrod and he could talk to Turgon about their own separate visions, perhaps. Um, who else? The Merith Adarthod needs to be his initiative, Fingolfin's initiative. <laughs> Sorry, Zach is trolling me. <laughs> or address seeking answers about his parentage. <laughs> ha ha, Zach. Very funny. Um, <laughs> I will not be drawn. Um, okay. I think that I think that we have to show the Marath Adarthad as Fingolfin's initiative. Again, show him taking leadership in trying to establish reconciliation with this with the Sindar. Um, and part of that conversation, maybe it's a follow-up, maybe it's the end of we do need a conversation, Ellen, I agree with you. We do need a conversation where um, where um, they talk, right? The leaders of the Noldor talk about like, okay, how do we handle the whole Kinslang thing? Like, what do we do? Um, what can we say and how do we handle this? Um, I do think that that conversation needs to happen and there needs to be, there need to be concerns about not just how are we going to, you know, cover ourselves, right? And how are we going to hide this? But, you know, there should be different thoughts about what we need to do, what's the right thing to do. And we, um, Fingolfin should not just be, his primary initiative can't simply be obfuscation, right? You know, he can't be like, all right, folks, let's find ways to conceal the truth, right? Let's, uh, let's go, let's consider how we can, like, again, that's, that's not the end goal. That's not his end game. His end game is reconciliation. We need to work with them. We need to, we need to accept them. We need to help them to accept us. I think that his agreement that they shouldn't confess the kinslang, that's one option. That's got to be an option on the table, right? An option on the table in that discussion has to be, let's, make a clean breast of it. Let's confess what happened and seek their forgiveness uh, for killing their kin because we're awful sorry that it happened. Right. And then again, then we have Karen there being like, I'm not right. But anyway, like most of the rest of them are. Um, so, you know, again, non fanorian camp. Um, but again, in the end, they decide they're not going to, they're not going to talk about it. Um I kind of like that conversation ending with at least like the plans. Let's let's try to set up a celebration. Like let's let's celebrate being together. Let's focus on togetherness, people, right? Uh, and so he starts organizing the Marathad or Thad, which doesn't happen immediately. So that can happen sometime in the first, you know, handful of episodes. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and Francis, I agree. It's not just about deliberate evasion. It's also possibly about, you know, not bringing up bad memories and, and you know, helping his own people to get past it. I mean, that would be part of the argument. It wouldn't just be, by all means, let's... It's, it's not just a cover-up operation. That's part of it. There is a cover-up operation also happening, but that's not the only motivation. Again, we can't, if we show Fingolfin and the other leaders of the non feanorian Noldor just like involved in a huge conspiracy to cover up the truth, and that's their whole motivation is just to, to preserve their own images by covering up the truth. Uh, I mean, we can't, we can't turn, you know, like the Kinsling into Watergate. You know, I mean, that's just, we don't want that. N nobody wants that. Um, 
like seriously, you want Fingolfin to be parallel to Nixon? I don't think you do. Uh, I know I certainly don't. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So we'll, have to, we'll we'll think in more detail through that conversation when we get there uh, in the outlines. But I think that those things can come along together well. And Ellen, you're right to say that we do need to uh, uh, to be considering military things as well. He has to be involved in the uh, establishing the siege. Um, so I think that that can be a thing that he does with that could even happen like really at the same time as the, his acceptance as high king. Um, when he like when they're all together, Feanorians and non Feanorians, uh, and they, um, uh, you know, they they decide how they're going to set up the leaguer of uh, of of Angband. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you want to have it later, Ellen? You want to have it at the Dagor Aglareb? Okay, we could do that. Um, that would make sense. It would give us a reason that, I mean, actually, yeah, we might as well like maximize the number of times we get Fingolfin on screen, right? So we will have him involved um, in the Dagor Aglareb. We will have him, so we can show him, we can show his personal, like military leadership, right? Um, that is Fingolfin with his new sword, which we've shown him forging, but not using yet. Um, so we can show him using his new sword against the orcs and um, leading the elves to a crushing victory, um, you know, with Fingon as well. Um, and um, if that precipitates further military discussion, again, it gives us an opportunity both to show him being acting in a leadership way, but also it gives us an opportunity to show him interacting with the rest of the Noldor, right? Uh, you know, we were talking about the question, how do the other rulers relate to the High King? Like, what are the circumstances under which his authority over them comes up? And we agreed that one of those things was military matters, right? So having him step in and kind of say, okay, <clears throat> post Dagor Agler, it gets clear, Morgoth is going to keep attacking. Let's, you know, I've taken some thought for this and I think we need to dispose of ourselves in this way in order to, to hold Morgoth in leaguer, right? Um, and that'll give the, uh, the sons of, you know, like the Caranthiers and Kurafins the opportunity to complain about it, right? We shouldn't be holding him in leaguer. We should be attacking. We're never going to get the Silmarils back this way. You know, this is a cowardly approach, blah, blah, blah. You know, so we can have some opposition to his leadership from the Feanorians, which from the point of view of the Oath of Feanor would work, you know, would, would, would sure make a lot of sense. Um, but of course, the wisdom and moderation and, you know, he's already proven his courage in the Dagor Aglareb, not to mention that at the Helcaraxa. And so, you know, he's operating in a position of strength and showing wisdom and restraint and leadership. I think that that all works um, pretty well. So, OK. All right. Hakan, I don't know if that's enough. I don't know if it's enough, um, but it's tough. I mean, without like inventing lots of brand new things out of whole cloth, right? Without just giving him more things to do, uh, you know, that are just completely, uh, you know, not even hinted at in the text. It's hard because he just, again, he just does not have, um, uh, he just does not have a uh, big role, right? Uh, as far as like personally accomplishing things. Um, yeah. So we do have to be thinking about that. Um, ooh, Tony says, what if he's the target of spying operations by the enemies? Yeah. Tony, let's keep that in mind when we talk about the bad guys plot. We'll think about that. Uh, let's remember looking for opportunities to get some more awesome Fingolfin moments uh, in the context of planning that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, cool. Okay. Um, good. That doesn't totally solve the Fingolfin problem, but it, it kind of moves it along a little bit, at least kind of contextualizes it some. Okay, cool. Um, I go away, you're talking about Galadriel and Calabar. I come back, you're talking about something completely different. What see, I'm happen? talking about Fingolfin, Trish, just like I ah, promised. We came like back to it at the end. Okay. It's all good. All right. It's all good, good. yeah. All right. That works. So I think, uh, I think we, hey, guess what? 
we totally accomplished what we wanted to accomplish. And it's not even <laughs> the last second. It's only been like barely over two hours. So uh, that's kind of amazing. So, hey, so let's talk about what we're going to talk about next. And next, we're going to talk about, uh, we want to shift. We've been talking about Noldor a lot. So the next thing on our list is the dwarves and the petty dwarves. Uh, so let's get into the dwarf story next time and figure out. And here, of course, we have a different challenge, right? Um, we have very, very little from the text about this. And so we're going to be uh, making a lot more stuff up uh, as we go this and, 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 and thinking about it's going to be connected, of course, with uh, stories like Finrod and Nargothrond. We've got to connect it to there. We're going to be setting up meme. Of course, meme is going to be lurking in the background in a sense. Um, uh, as we talk about the dwarves and petty dwarves. <clears throat> From there, we're going to transition, I think, fairly naturally to Aeol. Are we going to get to Aeol next time? Who knows? We'll definitely talk about the dwarves next time. No promises. But if we do finish talking about the dwarves next time, Aeol will be the thing we will talk about after that. And then after that, we'll talk about the villains. But um, and let's be honest, I don't have much aspirations. We're actually going to get to that one next time. But hey, you never know. Stranger things have happened occasionally. Um, ooh, we didn't talk about Luthien, but that's okay. We'll talk about Luthien later, so that'll be fine. Um, you know, the uh, the danger here is we're now um, um, we are reinforcing this uh, this practice of Marie um, basically telling us what we're going to talk about. I know that is dangerous, actually. Don't we worry. can always rebel at some point. I, I, I don't. I don't think we're in. We're in too much risk of developing a habit of compliance and, uh, That's uh, true. you know, completing our assignments without deviation. Uh, so, it doesn't seem that our. It doesn't seem that our danger is very great uh, when it when it comes to that. Um, uh, so Zach, yeah, I notice you'll notice Zach. I did not promise that we would talk about Ordreth next time. <laughs> I just said we were going to talk. We weren't talking about him today. Um, there are a bunch of elvish loose ends that we still need to 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 reconcile. Ordreth is one. Luthien is another. We need to think through her character more and what she's up to. Um, uh, so we will be coming back to those later. But I think it's going to be fun to sort of step away from the stuff that we've been talking about and think about something almost completely different and uh, start with the dwarves for next time. So, all right. Um, so uh, so that's the plan for next time. Uh, don't forget that next time is gonna be Friday. Actually, it says Friday, January 4th. Uh, we're gonna actually stick with Friday, January 11th. Uh, which So we're just gonna flat skip the next. So then our next scheduled episode uh, would be December 28th, and then the one after that would be January 11th, rather than just budging it, because I'm actually going to still be busy on Friday the 4th. Easiest thing, we're just going to we're just going to skip the 28th one entirely. We're going to so that's going to be off for the holidays, and we'll be back on January 11th actually. So, um, so that's the point. So we have four weeks until our next uh, session, which is a long time so you, to go. But there's so lots you don't want to do another one next week. Hi. <laughs> I considered it actually, but I'm like, you know what? No, I, I think we should. Let's do it. It's going to draw a line in the sand somewhere. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, all right. So plenty of stuff to think about, plenty of time in which to think about it. And we'll come back for some more fun discussion four weeks from now. Thanks everybody. Uh, I appreciate your being with me and say, as always, thanks for listening and Godspeed. I think this is the first podcast we've done in over a year where you didn't have to run off like, oh, I got to be somebody that I've seen. So true. I think it's also the first podcast in ages that you're actually running into grifflet time. You actually have like breathing space. I mean. You've got 20 yeah, minutes. Like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to run off to grifflet. Yeah, I know. You can actually go take a bio break. <laughs> Who knows? Oh, I mean, I can have lunch. You can have lunch. The last time I had lunch on a Friday. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> oh me yeah awesome by the way the fall festival is opened on Lotro and there's a new instance where you have to fight um, snowman so fight snowman? Might yeah you have to wow. help the children save frost bluff so you have to save Cluckland and other places oh. and yeah it's really cute and uh, so you end up fighting snowmen yeah so Griffle might enjoy doing that right right okay 
we'll see. Well, I'm, fi- I'm finishing. Uh, so I've been doing the Limb Light Gorge, which I never <sighs> crazy man. did. So, yeah. It's good. Crazy. Well, you did. Fi- you finished the in- instance, right? Last week. So. I did finish the instance. Yeah. So yeah, it's almost done. I- I'm pretty yeah. much wrapped with it. And then we're gonna. I'll continue. I'll go down to the field of Celebron, uh after that. So. Cool. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, well, that was fun. Hopefully, by the next time, back. I'll figure out how to see questions. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what's up with that. That's really weird. Bizarre. Bizarre. Yeah. Very, Very strange. Anyway. Thanks, everybody, for your time, and uh, we'll see you guys in four weeks. Happy holidays, everybody. Yeah, bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Although the theoretical budget of our hypothetical blockbuster may be unlimited, the production budgets of this and the rest of our fun alternative educational projects are unfortunately not. If you have enjoyed joining our production team, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.